Audiobook title Godzilla Earth Origin, 00-19, by Zastra underscore Vandesh. This work belongs to author Zastra underscore Vandesh. Source Scribblehub.com. Chapter 0, The First Landing. If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. I saw another beast coming up out of the sea. It had 10 horns and 7 heads, with 10 crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. Book of Revelation. Revelation 13 verse 1. Are you the reporter for this time? The topic of the interview is, the first landing, right? In the darkness across from me, a man sat in the middle, smoking and looking this way, then slowly spoke. The first landing. It feels like a long time ago. Let's begin. The interview officially started. On that day, after a long absence, I returned to my hometown, Cape Soya, Tien. Cape Soya is a city in Hokkaido, Japan. From North America to visit my grandparents, and negotiate the demolition. At that time, the second expansion of the Hokkaido Super City Cluster had begun. Aiming to establish a connection with the offshore city of Graffitimoni and the supersonic train of the Super City Cluster, with one of the stations being Cape Soya. At that time, Cape Soya was still unknown to the world due to the first landing. Before the landing, it was just a small city located at the northernmost tip of Hokkaido, with a population of barely 200,000. Our ancestral home was located on the southeastern coast of this small city, a very quiet place where you could see Graffitimoni several kilometers away. However, a quiet location also meant that there were no people and the land was cheap. It was precisely because of this that the train did not bypass us but intended to directly demolish our ancestral home and the surrounding houses by compensating us with money. According to the union standards, they should have paid 40 million vei but they were only willing to pay 10 million vei and even threatened my grandparents not to speak out. Of course, my grandparents did not yield to the threat but told the whole family. However, at that time, we didn't have a good solution, so we could only ask me to come back first. In the morning when I received the news, I asked my mentor to come back home with me. At that time, my mentor had achieved a Nobel-level accomplishment, although it hadn't been officially awarded at that time. It was already a sure thing in the future. With his influence in the scientific community, I believe that we could resolve this matter soon. I made an appointment with those people to meet at my house in an hour. They kept the appointment and arrived at my house an hour later. At that time, we began the negotiations, and it was during the negotiations that the first landing of that thing began. At this point, his voice trembled. First, there was a strong tremor. The ceiling and furniture shook violently, and the people negotiating inside the house felt a strong tremor. But the negotiations did not stop, they continued. Even the old house built with earthquake-resistant materials a hundred years ago could withstand an eight-magnitude earthquake. So this level of shaking was not enough to panic them. The last time people died in Hokkaido due to an earthquake was twenty years ago, and earthquakes today were not deadly. Then came the thunderous sound. After the tremors, thunderous sounds erupted like dry thunder, followed by another tremor, then another thunder. At this moment, Someone realized that something was wrong. The negotiations were interrupted, and people went downstairs and gathered in the yard of the old house. Looking in the direction from where the sound came, the endless sea surface. Then came the dorsal fin, like a mountain peak. From the endless sea surface, the people who came out could see a large shadow moving in the middle. It was larger than any fishing boat and was advancing towards the shore. Every movement it made caused the earth to shake, and the thunderous sound resounded once again. At this moment, a large crowd had gathered on the shore, attracted by the thunderous sound and tremors. They all saw the shadow underwater. Then, in full view of everyone, the shadow broke the surface of the water, revealing a dorsal fin like a mountain peak. Finally, the embodiment of destruction appeared. The crowd scattered after the appearance of the dorsal fin, and people started running towards a direction away from the shore, desperately running. But it was already too late. Or rather, the people here had missed their chance to leave from the moment it chose to land here, because destruction itself had arrived. Two minutes later, a massive figure emerged from the sea, standing at a towering 200 meters tall. Its black skin, muscular legs, powerful stance, and sword-like dorsal fins made it seem like a relic from 100 million years ago, transported through time to this place. Its colossal presence exuded a power beyond human comprehension. Its massive tail struck the seabed causing earthquakes. Every footstep reverberated with a thunderous boom that echoed through the valleys. Roar! The sound transformed into a tangible shockwave, spreading in all directions. The previously calm sea surface was lifted by the sonic impact, 
creating towering waves nearly 10 meters high. All the glass within a 100 meters shattered. Even the crowds that had been running for two minutes felt as if their heads had been struck by a heavy hammer. On its dinosaur-like head were a pair of serene eyes. It scanned the dots below, the rapidly moving maglev vehicles, and the towering buildings of Graffitimoni that dwarfed even itself. It lowered its head and opened its mouth. And then, light appeared within its mouth. The air emitted a blue glow, a manifestation of ionized air from gamma radiation. Three seconds after the appearance of the blue glow, the highly energized plasma, confined by a strong magnetic field, pierced through the atmosphere at a speed of 50 Mach. No one could hear the sound it made because, before the sound, the spreading plasma had already incinerated everything in its path. The range of the strong magnetic field was not far, which allowed the spewed plasma to immediately begin expanding after leaving the creature's mouth. However, due to its immense speed, it often struck its target before fully spreading. Upon impact, violent thermal explosions followed. The plasma, with temperatures reaching tens of thousands of degrees, expanded rapidly once freed from the constraints of the magnetic field. The outward thermal pressure generated by the explosion caused the originally 2 to 3 meter wide linear ion beam to expand almost instantly into a massive fireball over 1 kilometer in diameter, with internal temperatures surpassing that of the sun's surface. It engulfed houses, streets, and people on the ground. The colossal creature turned its head, and the flames spewing from its mouth sliced through everything in its path like a cutting laser, obliterating all obstacles. Not only was the land beneath its feet incinerated, but the city several kilometers away was also affected by this devastating assault. By the time the plasma flame reached a distance of over 10 kilometers, it was no longer a mere line confined by magnetic forces, but had transformed into a fiery storm with a width of over 10 kilometers and a length of tens of meters. Skyscrapers hundreds of meters high were instantly covered by the intense heat of the flames. Although the flames no longer possessed the kinetic energy to destroy the structural integrity of the buildings, the terror of the extreme heat obliterated everything except the core structures. Vehicles were melted into molten metal in an instant, and the people on the streets were turned into charred remains before their pain could even register in their brains. The supersonic train was reduced to molten debris and the high-rise buildings housing thousands of people were burning. The entire city was engulfed in a sea of fire. The firestorm not only brought destruction itself but its secondary disaster, the ignited materials releasing energy no less devastating than the flames. This immense heat circulated in the sky above the city, mercilessly claiming the lives of all living beings engulfed by the spreading flames, just as humanity had done to this world 200 years ago. However, this time, humans were the victims. The colossal beasts as your eyes surveyed the burning metropolis. And then, it submerged back into the depths of the sea, disappearing from the gaze of the survivors. On March 16, 2208, at 1300 hours, an unnamed titan landed from the direction of Cape Soya in Hokkaido, launching an attack on the oceanic city of Graffitimoni before diving back into the ocean. According to later statistics, this landing caused over 500,000 deaths and over 2 million injuries. This unnamed titan was bestowed with the title of the god of destruction from local mythology. Its name, Godzilla. 19. Chapter 1. The Awakening of Godzilla. If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Walking in the depths of the ocean, the ancient beast once known as Godzilla advanced towards the deep sea. Just like 200 years ago, when it strolled beneath the melting ancient ice caps, today's Godzilla was in a foul mood. Yesterday, it had just awakened from its latest slumber. But then, it discovered something strange in its mind and received peculiar information injected into it. As it opened its eyes from its slumber, besides seeing the pitch black sea floor, it also noticed something peculiar within its field of view. Host name, Godzilla. Height, 218 meters. Weight, 640,000 tons. Breath, high temperature plasma. There was a small panel in the upper left corner of its perspective displaying ancient symbols that detailed all the information about itself. It recognized those characters. They were the symbols the little creatures used in their rituals before its ten previous slumbers, back when it resided in the land over the sea with darker, salter waters. Over the course of hundreds of rituals, it gradually learned to understand them, so it could comprehend the information displayed. However, understanding the information was one thing, and the transformation itself was another. Those little creatures perished along with the sinking of the land during its slumber. It hadn't seen those symbols since its ninth slumber. So why were they appearing in its field of vision now? And it was being tasked to eliminate its own kind. 
It glanced down below the panel, where a main mission and several side missions were listed. Main mission, expel humans from the universe. Damn humans have destroyed the planet's ecosystem. As the representative of this planet, for all the deceased creatures, can you use your atomic breath, Godzilla, to make them leave the universe? Current completion, 0%. Reward, advanced materials, advanced energy sources, planet's ecological restoration. Side mission, first step in expelling the universe. The awakening of the king of monsters is accompanied by absolute fury. Destroy any human city. Reward, one body strength evolution. Side mission, the benevolence of the king of monsters. These were truly strange missions. Why were they asking me to eliminate their own kind? It felt puzzled and swayed its body. Then, it stood up from the layer of rock it had spent the past 200 years in. Godzilla did not follow the instructions above. It was a pacifist, unlike its fellow creatures who didn't care about the life or death of other beings. As the oldest member of the Titan species, it cherished those little creatures. Since its hazy juvenile period millions of years ago, it had witnessed countless lives dwindling and being destroyed, experienced the mass extinction event, and five smaller extinctions. It deeply respected the efforts of these little creatures, whose lifespans were a fraction of its own but created structures and civilizations that even the nearly eternal titans couldn't construct. Though their existence was less than 10,000 years, the amazement they brought to it during that time surpassed anything it had experienced in the past hundred million years. When it learned that the continent had sunk into the sea after awakening, it was disheartened for a long time. However, later discovering their descendants on other continents brought it joy for a while. But it seemed these descendants did not inherit the reverence for nature from their ancestors. They would even attack them. After realizing this, Godzilla and its kind gradually disappeared from the sight of these little creatures, waiting for their demise. The Godzillas were patient beings. Since you don't like us, we're willing to give you this period of time in the world. After all, we are eternal, while you are fleeting. Making way or not, it doesn't matter. Swinging its tail, Godzilla emerged from the thousands of meters deep ocean trench. The ocean this time was unexpectedly quiet. The songs of the whales that once filled the entire ocean had vanished. It seemed they couldn't endure the passing of these 200 years. This made it a little unhappy. It quite liked those singers. But before going to sleep, the number of those singers was already in jeopardy. So it was not surprising that they disappeared after waking up this time. However, it still felt a bit down. Swimming to the shallow sea, Godzilla prepared to bask in the sunlight, which it hadn't done in a long time. But as it swam, it noticed that something was amiss. During its ascent, it didn't see any living beings other than itself. The resilient small fish and shrimps had also vanished, and the seawater had become extremely foul. It was filled with something strange. That something was capable of killing ordinary life forms and only emitted by luminescent stones deep underground. In the past, they were extremely rare, and only a few titans who relied on these stones could find places with a large quantity of them. But now, they were everywhere in the vast ocean. No creatures, no life. The once vibrant coral reefs were gone, schools of fish disappeared, and phosphorescent shrimps were nowhere to be found. The ocean was outrageously empty, far emptier than the several extinctions it had witnessed. Even the ocean during the fall of a celestial body had more life than this. Godzilla sensed that something was wrong. It emitted a low growl, the sound used by titans to communicate. It wanted to know why this was happening from the mouths of the titans who had awakened during its slumber. But something even more unsettling occurred. Its calls received no response from any titans. Growl. It amplified its voice, broadcasting its waves with all its strength. But not a single titan responded. Not even when it magnified the sound to the extent that it could wake up titans still in their slumber. No titan woke up to answer it. Unease turned into restlessness. It switched to a different frequency, a natural frequency. It was the wavelength where the will of nature itself resided, the only thing on this planet older than it. And this time, it received a response. But it didn't come from outside, it came from within its own body. Upon receiving this wavelength on the screens in the corners of its eyes, a large amount of information was sent to its brain. This information included everything that had occurred during its 200 years of slumber. There were scenes of humans capturing various slumbering titans and dissecting them to study their mobile nuclear reactors. There were scenes of the slumbering titans who were awakened by human weapon bombardment. There were scenes of humans triumphing against the titans. There were scenes of humans engaging in civil war due to various disputes after their victory. There were scenes of a continuous nuclear war that lasted for decades, causing complete ecological collapse, with only the humans hiding underground surviving. 
the surviving humans grew weary of war and returned to the surface. All of humanity's history and knowledge was entrusted to Godzilla, who fully understood everything that had happened while it was asleep. During its slumber, those insignificant little creatures killed all of its kind and started a civil war, leading to a nuclear conflict that lasted for decades. Although the initial warring parties launched hundreds of thousands of nuclear missiles, none of them managed to completely destroy the opposing industrial systems. As both sides had anticipated the outcome and secretly relocated a portion of their industries underground, the war did not cripple everyone at the beginning, so it had to continue. Nuclear weapons were continuously produced and launched, and even if a wave of destruction occurred, as long as 10% of the cities remained, the entire industrial system would not be paralyzed, and the war would continue. Self-sustaining industrial robots were responsible for the production, and as long as one human survived, the war would persist. At this point, the number of remaining humans was no longer the focus of the war. Hundreds or thousands of nuclear bombs were manufactured every day, and the same number were detonated. In the process, nuclear reactors were shattered due to the explosions, releasing unimaginable radiation and creating unprecedented nuclear wastelands. Due to the difficulty for robots to operate under strong radiation, everyone tacitly manufactured dirty bombs, the dirtier, the better. In this situation, humans barely managed to survive thanks to their technology, but other forms of life couldn't withstand the continuous nuclear warfare. This war ultimately led to the extinction of over 99% of terrestrial life and over 99% of marine life. Even insects vanished completely. The natural consciousness, which had not been impacted by the Permian extinction, also declined in the face of this catastrophe, carrying a sense of helplessness. It entrusted all of its perceived information and desires to the last titan, Godzilla. The final wish of the natural consciousness was simple. It wanted Godzilla to eradicate the remaining humans. It wasn't afraid of its own death. It simply feared the end of life on this planet. It was afraid that one day, the wars among technologically advanced humans would kill every microorganism on this planet. Therefore, it requested to expel all remaining humans, so that life on this planet would have a future, and in billions of years, a new ecosystem could evolve. Exile them all, without leaving anyone behind. 16. Chapter 2 evolution of Godzilla. If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Nature has perished. Godzilla was deeply saddened by this. Although it was unexpected for the humans to kill the Titan monsters, the gargantuan monster could understand it, as the Titans had also killed humans before. While the Titans were near eternal, they were still part of nature, and conflicts and killings among Titans had occurred in the past. As the king of the titans, the oldest titan, Godzilla had witnessed the succession and renewal of multiple generations of titans. So it could understand, but it couldn't accept it. In the past, at least the titans left offspring, there were still next generations. But now, apart from itself, all titans no longer exist. Even their descendants are gone. Not to mention the titans, even the large terrestrial creatures have almost died. This is more severe than any previous mass extinction event. The world's ecosystem has regressed to the Ediacaran period. Because nature provided all the knowledge to humans, Godzilla understands everything. To evolve Titan life again would require even more time. Godzilla was deeply saddened. But then it remembered its control panel, which still had the reward for the main mission. Reward, advanced materials, advanced energy, planetary ecosystem reshaping. Godzilla ignored the first two rewards and looked at the last one, reshaping the planet's ecosystem. Is this possible? Godzilla didn't know. The information provided by nature did not mention this control panel, and it was unaware that such a thing existed on Godzilla. However, the human knowledge it received from nature, through the literary works of the Sunrise Country and the Hua Nation, often mentioned similar entities. In their literary works, this control panel possessed enough power to reshape the planet. It also had enough power for Godzilla to annihilate humans. Now, it can fulfill the last wish left by nature. And perhaps, it can witness the rebirth of this planet. The system offers five enhancements for its body, which are breath, body composition, size, power supply reaction, and self-repair capability. Now, Godzilla's current situation is as follows. Power supply reaction magnetic confinement deuterium tritium fusion, dormant power of 10 gigawatts, active power of 0.5 terawatts, with a maximum of 300 terawatts. Note 1. Size. 218 meters. Mass of 500,000 tons. 
total length of 389 meters, can be increased through feeding. Body composition, composite armor consisting of carbon fiber muscles, aluminum silicon alloy, and carbon steel. Breath, high temperature plasma, maximum output of 280 terawatts. Dot. Self-repair capability, 5,000 tons per day. This is Godzilla's current panel. Based on the knowledge provided by nature, Godzilla realizes that its composition is considered outdated compared to humans. The combination of aluminum silicon alloy, carbon steel, and carbon fiber for its armor is insufficient against the weapons developed by humans before the war. A single electromagnetic cannon shot would create a hole several meters deep, and with its small body, it could probably withstand a thousand shots. After all, there are still several tens of meters of solid material, and even if one continuously hits the same spot, it would take 10 electromagnetic cannon shots to reach its internal organs. But it finds this condition unreliable for annihilating humans. A thousand shots are not a significant number for humans. It needs a stronger body. Side mission, first step in space rolling, completed. Reward, one body strength evolution. Would you like to use it now? Note, this evolution will require 48 hours, during which the host will enter the deepest sleep. Please proceed with the evolution when everything is secure. In the underwater near Hokkaido, Godzilla looks at the mission record on its panel, feeling the changes within its body. An hour ago, after its breath swept through that floating city, its mission panel rang like a mobile phone. It reminded it that the mission was completed. Well, it's time to retreat. The current Godzilla does not want to confront the frontal forces of the small creatures. So after using its breath to destroy a city, it descended back into the sea and swam towards the depths. Evolution takes time. Humans have developed too fast during its 200-year slumber. They have explored most parts of this planet, including the underwater areas. However, Godzilla still has some good places to stay, such as the caves it dug out for hibernation. And the residences built for it by those early little humans are also good places. The entire Pacific can serve as Godzilla's resting place. It descends to the deepest part of the sea, and after roaming for a while, it reaches its nest at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, which it dug out. Humans should not be able to reach this place within 48 hours. The last time Godzilla returned to this place was thousands of years ago. At that time, although the trench was dark, there were many beautiful creatures that its sonar could see. Godzilla is proud of its sensitivity to perception. Unfortunately, the abyss is now filled with radioactive wastewater and there is no living creature that can be seen. Even the floating planktonic organisms have become scarce. The king of monsters submerges into the deepest sea floor, the Mariana Trench, where the terrifying pressure is nothing to it. The pressure that can crush steel is like a massage to Godzilla. As it swims underwater, relying on its past memories, Godzilla quickly finds its old nest in this location. It was established tens of thousands of years ago, when human civilization had not yet developed on the surface. It used to enjoy the hydrostatic massage here, so it chose this place as its hibernation nest. Later, with the rise of human civilization on the continent in the Atlantic, it moved its nest to the other side of the Atlantic to observe them and enjoy their offerings. Godzilla can guarantee that it is not bored being a titan. The natural signals in the trench were not very good, so it moved to a place where it could communicate with other beings. It simply wanted to observe those little humans but it never expected that they would be wiped out by a sudden disaster, and it didn't even get a chance to see their final moments. Now there are little humans everywhere, but their numbers are too great, to the extent that they have squeezed out the living space of other creatures. Even the almost eternal titans have been completely wiped out. It really wants to go back to the past, but it's not possible. It's time to sleep. Lying in its nest, Godzilla closes its eyes and begins the evolution process. Equals 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 note. 1. 1 terawatt equals 10 to the power of 12 watts, which means releasing 10 to the power of 12 joules of energy per second. The energy of 1 ton of TNT is 4.18 times 10 to the power of 9 joules, so the power of 1 terawatt is approximately equivalent to the explosion energy of 240 tons of TNT per second. 1 petawatt equals 1000 terawatts equals 1 million gigawatts, GW equals 1 billion megawatts equals 1 trillion kilowatts equals 10 quadrillion watts. The scale is in increments of 1000. Equals 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 equals. 15. Chapter 3. Varied States Part 1. If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon. They are 10 chapters ahead. Mr. Akiyama, this is the casualty report up until just now. Thank you for your hard work, Mr. Yarrow. Mr. Akiyama, 
Here are the reports on building damage and evaluations of nuclear radiation intensity. The situation in the southern city district is not optimistic. Hmm, hand me the data. You should take a rest, Jean. Mr. Akiyama, the senator is calling for you, and Mr. Akiyama, your wife will definitely be fine. I understand. Thank you for your wishes. I'll go there shortly. Mr. Akiyama, what time is the press conference scheduled for today? 2 p.m. By the way, help me send this disaster report to General Arita. You can all leave after that. It's already late. It's not a problem. How can we possibly leave today? Moreover, compared to me, you should take a proper rest. You've been acting a bit crazy today. First login, 15 hours later. March 17th, 2208, exactly 4 o'clock. The Hokkaido government hall was still brightly lit, with everyone working diligently. The government hall was supposed to close at 1900 hours, but today no one was resting. Every person forced themselves to stay alert, handling the continuous flow of reports in their hands. The population survey for the North City District is in 8,720 deaths and 12,321 missing persons. The total number of affected buildings has been fully accounted for. There are 1,450 buildings completely reduced to ruins, and a total of 53,191 buildings contaminated by nuclear radiation. After 14 hours of intense work, everyone's energy was completely drained. However, under such high pressure, no one quit, and no one complained, because they knew that by working one more minute, they might be able to save more lives. The casualty reports for all the districts, east, west, south, and north, have been compiled. The severely affected areas with a possibility of a large number of survivors are here, here, and here. Planning team, we need you to plan the fastest rescue routes. We apologize for keeping you up tonight. Akiyama, what are you talking about? As the Minister of Emergency Management, you must be the most exhausted. Don't worry, we'll handle the planning. You go and focus on your tasks. Rest assured, we will find them. Okay then, goodbye. I'm hanging up. Ending the live broadcast, Akiyama Ryo walked out of the remote projection room, dragging his exhausted body through the hurried crowd and squeezing into the elevator. Floor? The top floor conference room, thank you. There weren't many people in the elevator as most would send documents via computer if the floor was too far away. Usually, highly classified documents would be sent in paper form for security reasons, but today was different. It was too busy, and if they relied on people to deliver classified documents, the efficiency would be too slow. So today, regardless of the type of document, everyone is using computers. In fact, to obtain real-time information about the disaster, the government's internal network is directly connected to computers on site. If there were skilled hackers, this would be a good opportunity to breach the government's network and potentially gain fame in one fell swoop. Under normal circumstances, some people might take advantage of this opportunity to do something, but today is not a normal day. We've reached the top floor. Okay. Stepping quickly out of the elevator, Akiyama Ryo exerted his remaining energy and jogged down the corridor to the entrance of the conference room. After knocking on the door, he pushed it open. Akiyama-kun, you're the last one. You're a bit late. Sorry. Upon entering the room, Akiyama Ryo's first glance fell on his superiors and several ministers of equal rank, as well as two generals from the station military. They were sitting at the edge of the conference room's round table, wearing serious expressions as they gazed towards the center of the table. At the center of the conference room's table, several dozen motionless figures were projected in three-dimensional form. Below these projected figures, a countdown was nearing zero. He had a general idea of why the senator called him here. Nodding in acknowledgement and offering another apology to the seated individuals, Akiyama Ryo found the nearest seat and sat down. Like everyone else present, he focused his gaze on the projection in the center of the table, waiting for the countdown below to reach zero. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. As the countdown reaches zero, the motionless figures in the projection began to show slight movements. They came alive. Similar to the people at the round table, the projected figures also sat upright, facing the individuals at the round table, and delivered their emergency plans discussed by various departments over the past 10 hours in English. Senator Amano, after discussions, the committee has decided to temporarily halt trade in the northern port area of Hokkaido and designate it as a temporary rest and refit area for the Indian Ocean Fleet until that thing is subdued. Generals Luo and Alexei, together with Senator Amano, you should prepare the port where the fleet will dock. The fleet is scheduled to arrive at 
your location tonight at 20 hundred hours. We hope you can clear the port before their arrival. All docking vessels will be redirected to the urban areas of Tokyo, Osaka, and Busan. Additionally, Mr. Chester, the Pacific Fleet Commander-in-Chief, will arrive at your location promptly at 20 hundred hours to discuss the detailed process of this joint operation. The detailed information about the Indian Ocean Fleet will be sent later. Generals Luo and Alexei, as representatives of the local garrison, your main task in this operation is to support the local material supply for the Indian Ocean Fleet. This is a military proposal. As for the disaster relief plan for Gravitamoni, due to the local government's current loss of administrative capabilities, Senator Amano, we entrust the urban planning to you. An hour from now, rescue teams from Asia, Europe, and the Americas will arrive. The Minister of Emergency Management of Hokkaido should prepare for reception and coordinate the rescue efforts. Rescue supplies, including emergency food, clothing, and temporary housing, will arrive at your airport in three hours via airlift. We need at least three airports cleared for transportation. These are the results of our discussions. Farewell, for the future of humanity. Farewell, for the future of humanity. The projection disappeared. The meeting lasted for a total of 35 minutes. During this time, representatives from various departments of the joint effort informed the upper management of the Hokkaido urban area about their emergency rescue and subjugation plans. They devised a detailed plan for everything, from post-disaster reconstruction to the subjugation of that thing. Every matter was quickly processed and digested. After the meeting concluded, Akiyama Ryo returned to his work. Three hours later, having completed all his tasks, Akiyama Ryo boarded a dedicated vehicle. He was personally heading to Gravitamoni to welcome the rescue teams from different regions and oversee the on-site command. In the car, he looked at the wallpaper on his phone, featuring the smiles of three individuals, with the words, A family never separates. His heart remained restless for a long time. 10. Chapter 4 Varied States Part 2 If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Gravitamoni was one of the five ecological restoration zones established by the World United Government, a place that everyone in the world envied and desired to live in. Outside the car window stretched boundless greenery. In terms of forest coverage alone, the Earth now had a much greater forest area than during the nuclear war era 200 years ago. However, its ecology had not fully recovered because this green expanse was devoid of life. There were no animals, no shrubs, and even the trees and grass were of a single species. Although this greenery appeared vibrant, it was essentially no different from a desolate wasteland. The forests covering the planet today were merely new breeds of plants created by humans after the nuclear war. The original native plants had long since perished under constant nuclear explosions and radiation. Initially, in order to transform the barren surface, humans created resilient plants and laboratories that could withstand strong radiation and survive the super nuclear winter. They scattered these plants in every corner of the planet, hoping that it would return to the era of lush greenery. While the greenness had returned, true vitality remained elusive. After global forest coverage was achieved, humans even attempted to release a series of genetically modified animals into nature, aiming to restore natural balance. However, during the process, humans discovered something. Due to the inherent absence of the food chain, the animals they released either couldn't adapt to the environment, and starved in the wild or exhibited explosive vitality, resulting in pest and animal infestations. Even if humans consciously released multiple species of animals to establish a food chain, it proved futile. The planet was vast and empty, and without human intervention, as long as a herbivore found itself in a place without natural predators, it could easily multiply uncontrollably. Furthermore, the natural predators themselves were too fragile compared to herbivores that could eat anything. Factors such as slow reproduction rates and difficulty in finding food often result in the release of herbivores being hunted down by predators, leaving only a few individuals. Then, when these surviving animals rapidly reproduce, they reach a point where even reintroducing predators would lead to disaster. In such a situation, people were unable to rebuild the entire ecological system of the planet. Instead, they opted for a secondary solution by enclosing specific areas and establishing controlled ecosystems within them. Through human intervention, they gradually created stable regions. The World United Government established a total of five such ecological zones and built cities around these zones, promoting them as the future and dawn of humanity. These areas boasted beautiful flora and fauna, purified air, and filtered seawater, making them the best places in the world. 
Only the wealthiest and most influential individuals could reside there. Akiyama believed in it. Sir, we have arrived. As he gazed at the smiling faces of the family on his phone, Akiyama became somewhat immersed in them. It wasn't until the driver reminded him of their arrival that he put his phone back in his bag, stepped out of the car, and looked around. The buildings in the south zone have been almost completely leveled. There are charred bodies everywhere and extremely high levels of radiation. Near the point of impact, the breath of that titan pierced through the floating city's levitation panels, causing seawater from below to flood the surface. The entire south zone is sinking. I'm sorry boss, but in this situation they... Although he had already seen such devastation in the photos, the actual scene was more horrifying than he had imagined. Buildings reduced to skeletal remains were surrounded by white cloth-covered bodies. The stench of burned flesh permeated the air, mingling with the smell of disinfectant, creating a nauseating odor. Relatives of the deceased knelt before the white cloth, weeping. Their cries were heart-wrenching. From each building, medical personnel in protective suits occasionally carried unrecognizable bodies towards temporary shelters racing against death, trying to save as many lives as possible. But it was too late. It was already too late. The race against death was often futile. Most of the time, the result of an all-out rescue effort by medical personnel only meant adding another body under the white cloth. With each occurrence like this, people's spirits plummeted further. This was the most devastating catastrophe in terms of casualties since the nuclear war, a misfortune for the human race. In this suffocating world, Akiyama felt somewhat lost. Are you Mr. Akiyama from the emergency rescue team? While Akiyama was still stunned by the scene, a group of journalists in radiation suits, who were interviewing a medical professional in the distance, noticed him. The crowd that had just surrounded the medical professional, making it difficult to move, suddenly rushed towards Akiyama with microphones and cameras, raising a barrage of questions. I'm a reporter from NHG TV. Can you tell us about the extent of the disaster? Mr. Akiyama, Mr. Akiyama. I'm a reporter from CCB TV. What are your thoughts on this catastrophe? I'm from TTDC. Do you know that the whole world is paying attention to this disaster? What can you say about the sudden appearance of the Titan? All sorts of microphones and cameras nearly pressed against Akiyama's radiation suit. He waved his hand, indicating that he had other matters to attend to and couldn't accept interviews. As he walked away from the crowd, he pushed aside the microphones that had come too close. The number of journalists kept increasing. And just when Akiyama was becoming increasingly impatient, the crowd of reporters suddenly dispersed, and a few soldiers in military radiation suits approached him. You are. Akiyama looked at the leader among them, while the other soldiers shoot away the journalists, preventing them from disturbing him. I'm Zhang Peng from the Asian rescue team. Our team leader heard that you were coming and specifically sent me to pick you up. As the leading soldier introduced himself, he also mentioned his background. Pointing towards the distant rows of makeshift tents, he said, Please, we have been waiting for you for quite some time. Ah, yes, sure. Faced with the soldier's enthusiasm, Akiyama felt somewhat overwhelmed. In the conservative Far East region, it was uncommon to encounter such warm greetings upon meeting someone. However, despite feeling overwhelmed, he knew he had a task at hand. Upon hearing that the rescue team had been waiting for him, Akiyama quickly followed Zhang Ping towards the tent. On the way there, Zhang Peng also discussed the three major rescue teams and their respective areas of operation in this rescue mission. The sudden calamity of the colossal beasts caught everyone off guard. After the attack on Graphidemony, the world went into a frenzy. Currently, the top 19 trending topics online are all related to the colossal beast, with the remaining one discussing official rescue operations. It can be said that the world's attention is focused here. The World United Government immediately dispatched tens of thousands of elite medical and rescue professionals, forming these three teams, to rush here overnight and provide aid to various regions. The Asian rescue team, to which he belonged, took the initiative to undertake the most difficult and heavily radiated South Zone rescue operation. The American rescue team was responsible for the West and the European team for the East. The initially smaller local rescue team was assigned to the relatively simpler northern region. However, there was still a small portion of the Hokkaido local rescue team that insisted on working in the South Zone, all because of Akiyama's connection. They all said they wanted to find your family, and refused to leave one by one. Along the way, Zhang Ping spoke to Akiyama about those foolish members of the local rescue team who chose to stay in the dangerous South Zone. Even after the major rescue teams had assigned their areas, they insisted on remaining in the most perilous South Zone. This gained the respect of the members of the Asian rescue team, 
although they were similar in their determination. In their conversation, Zhang Ping seemed to be quite familiar with his subordinates, as if they had known each other for hours, even though it had only been a couple of hours at most. Yet, he displayed such warmth. Were the people from Dahua all like this? This puzzled Akiyama, who was naturally introverted, from the Far East region, making it difficult for him to understand. Not long after, Akiyama and Zhang Ping arrived at the base camp of the Asian rescue team. Several isolation tents had already been set up there, ready to accommodate the patients who had just been rescued from life-threatening situations. Having survived the disaster and receiving care from medical personnel, many of the people were now able to speak and were joking around. There were also those who had found their loved ones alive, creating a sharp contrast with the outside world. After coming here from the death-filled outside, Akiyama's mood improved significantly. He and Zhang Peng quickly passed through the patient area and arrived at the largest tent. At first glance, he saw a subordinate inside the tent conversing with another senior military officer. He wanted to greet them, but upon seeing the expression on his subordinate's face upon spotting him, he seemed to understand something. 6. Chapter 5 Various States Part 3 If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Ah, 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 ah. Tears fell onto his hands, and he wanted to shout out loud, but his mind reminded him not to disturb others that are still around him. He dug his nails into his flesh, and only this pain could temporarily keep him sane and prevent him from shouting aloud. Despite being mentally prepared, despite having made preparations, despite numbing his brain with labor. But at the moment he saw them, he knelt down and let out an inhuman sound full of pain and anguish. In front of him was the burnt figure of his wife and daughter clung to each other in their final moment. They would never be separated again. Are, are you alright? Eritam Maikihai looked at his superior and good friend, feeling somewhat worried, and asked, Me. I'm fine. Akiyama Ryo adjusted his appearance, and prepared himself for the upcoming meeting with the Asian Zone Rescue Team's captain. Are you really okay? Erita doubted. That scene just now wasn't something an ordinary person could recover from in a short time. Even when the rescue team found the remains of the mother and daughter pair, embracing each other's lifeless bodies, they were deeply shocked. Not to mention Akiyama, who was directly involved. As a husband and a father, could he really recover from the impact of seeing the burnt body of their wife and daughter in just half an hour? Erita didn't believe Akiyama could recover so quickly. It wasn't that Erita looked down on his friend. On the contrary, because he held him in high regard and knew a lot about him, he understood that Akiyama would never be able to recover from this. I said I'm fine, and I mean it. I'm not the only one here who has lost family members. As the head of the emergency response department, I can't afford to be affected. Erita, I can't afford to be affected. After wrapping his hand with a bandage, Akiyama uttered these words. This statement left Erita speechless. He understood Akiyama's mindset. But in his view, if a person could invent their emotions in a situation like this, then they were no longer human. Being the head of the emergency response department meant being responsible. You go about your business. Erita told him not to worry about him. After tidying up his disheveled appearance, Akiyama put on his radiation suit and walked out of the tent. With the guidance of the personnel at the entrance, he made his way to the headquarters of the rescue team. A large tent stood before him. It's a pleasure to meet you. I am Akiyama Ryo, the head of the Hokkaido emergency response department. Hello, I'm Dong Gong Yong the captain of the Asian rescue team. I offer my condolences regarding your wife and daughter. Inside the headquarters of the rescue team, a middle-aged man in robust shape and military protective gear was talking to someone else. When the soldier escorting Akiyama informed the man of his arrival, he stopped the conversation, stood up, and voluntarily left the tent. Please come in. After exchanging greetings with Akiyama outside, Dong Gong Yong led him inside. As soon as they entered, Akiyama saw someone unexpected. General Luo? Yeah, Mr. Akiyama, please don't mind me. Don't mind me. Inside the tent, apart from the bustling medical personnel, there were several exceptionally special individuals. Among them were General Luo, whom Akiyama had met briefly a few hours ago, stationed in the Far East. At this moment, he was discussing something with a few individuals wearing medical protective suits. Upon seeing Akiyama enter, he told him not to mind his presence. What's going on? Akiyama was quite puzzled by the situation, as according to the orders, General Luo should have been busy organizing the port. So why was he here now? General Luo himself didn't explain this, but Captain Dong, being sensible, explained the current situation to Akiyama. The port has already been organized. 
General Luo came here to pay his respects to our scholars. Akiyama, you see, these individuals here are the renowned Titan team from our Asian region. They specialize in studying the Titan behemoths. This time, they wanted to see for themselves, so they all came over here. I see. After Captain Dong's explanation, Akiyama nodded, finally understanding. When he heard that the individuals in protective suits were a research team specializing in studying the Titan behemoths, Akiyama's heart was stirred with emotions. Time is of the essence, Mr. Akiyama. We should discuss the issue of rescue supplies for the rescue team. Okay. After resolving a brief misunderstanding, Akiyama Ryo began to discuss rescue matters with the various team leaders of the rescue team. This included the distribution of supplies, accommodation for rescue personnel, work schedules, and most importantly, the discussion of repairs to the breach in the Griffin Dam after it was cut open. Although the captains of the European and American rescue teams were not present in person, they participated in the meeting via video. This detailed rescue meeting lasted for over two hours before finally reaching a conclusion. Well, I should leave now to oversee the distribution of supplies. Goodbye. With the meeting concluded, Akiyama prepared to leave. However, as he was about to exit the tent, he hesitated. He seemed to be struggling with something, but eventually made up his mind. He turned around and said to the group of researchers who were repeatedly playing footage of Godzilla's landing, Could you please answer a few questions for me? Please, I want to know more about that creature. Saying that, he bowed deeply to the others. The researchers who were watching the video were startled. After hearing the request, they looked somewhat hesitant and glanced at General Luo, who was still present. General Luo looked at Akiyama, recalling the incident with his wife and daughter, and nodded, allowing them to answer Akiyama's questions. If it were a regular search plan, he would never allow it, as there was a risk of leaks that could jeopardize the operation. But this time, they were dealing with Titan behemoths. Even if there was a leak, what difference would it make? Could it target human plans? Could it know in advance where people would search and take shelter? That was impossible. So he agreed. And with General Luo's permission, the researcher stood up and said to Akiyama after a brief pause, Please go ahead. What would you like to ask? As they spoke, they all seemed a bit nervous. After all, this was a high-ranking official, a minister of a metropolitan area. The entire Far East region only had three metropolitan areas, and a minister of a metropolitan area was equivalent to a senior government official. Receiving their affirmative response, Akiyama stood up and stared at the faces of the researchers, saying, I want to ask, what are these titan behemoths exactly? Ah? Uh, upon hearing this question, the researchers present were somewhat surprised. They had thought that Akiyama would ask about the methods discussed with General Luo on how to find the titan behemoths. But they didn't expect. Is that all? By the way, an academic paper on titan ecology could answer your question easily. Why did you have to make such a big deal out of bowing? It made us think you were going to ask something confidential. Knowing that the question is not classified, everyone's mood improved significantly, and their answers became less restrained. What exactly are Titan behemoths? Mr. Akiyama, as someone from the Far East region, you must have watched a lot of monster movies, right? Yes. That's right. It's the same thing. Titan behemoths are the monsters from those monster movies. Or rather, those monsters were inspired by Titan behemoths. In the field of biology, we categorize the development of life into two types, our selection, which emphasizes reproductive capacity, and K-selection, which emphasizes individual growth potential. In our selection, the evolutionary direction focuses on reproductive power. If we consider the algae that still exists today as the pinnacle of our selection, then titan behemoths represent the pinnacle of K-selection, living beings with a nuclear fission reactor inside their bodies. In the past, Humanity believed that such life forms did not exist until the eve of the nuclear war, when we discovered the existence of these marvelous creatures. It even sparked a craze for giant monster works, but unfortunately, we soon exterminated them. Before their arrival, we could only see the extinct titan behemoths in films. If it weren't for witnessing it with our own eyes today, who would have imagined that the long extinct titan behemoths still exist, and the one we discovered is the largest individual? In the past, titan behemoths taller than 100 meters were extremely rare. The individual named Godzilla, for example, is at least 200 meters tall, truly deserving of the title king of the titans. It would have been better if this hadn't happened. What a pity. As she spoke, she became somewhat regretful. How good would it have been if this king of the titans hadn't killed humans? In that case, humans wouldn't have to kill it. But there are no ifs. However, 
Akiyama was more concerned about the description of the titan behemoth's size in her words. The largest titan in history at 200 meters? He felt worried because in the monster movies he had watched, monsters over 100 meters were already beyond human power. But this one is a whopping 200 meters tall. Can they really defeat it? He expressed his concerns to the monsterology PhD, and she simply laughed and said to Akiyama, Don't worry, Mr. Akiyama. You underestimate our weapons. The monsters in those movies are unrealistic and non-physical. Such materials simply don't exist in reality. Even if its size were 300 or 400 meters, it would be no match for our weapons. Rest assured, our military will definitely bring it down. Is that so? Having received this assurance, Akiyama's heart settled slightly. He remembered the burnt corpse of beloved wife and daughter in his mind. He clenched his fist. 9. Chapter 6 Before the Operation, Part 1 If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Why did you come over, Alexei? Weren't you supposed to receive the commanders of the two fleets? The fleet commanders and vice commanders from the Indian Ocean have arrived. They're all discussing the detailed operational plans with that old man, Chester. I couldn't get a word in, so I just came back. When I returned, I hardly saw anyone. After thinking it over, I decided to come and talk to you. I feel really frustrated today. The nuclear submarines from the entire Pacific Fleet and the Indian Ocean Fleet will participate in this extermination operation. It's unexpected that those naval folks who desperately insisted on maintaining submarines actually have a day where they are useful. This time, it's us who are useless. The longer we stay there, the more frustrated I feel. I have a feeling those old fogies are laughing at me. How do you say it in your dialect? Feng Shui turns and cycles? It's Feng Shui Lun Huan. Tian. Feng Shui Lun Huan can be understood as the concept of rotating or changing the arrangement or placement of objects or elements, according to the principles of Feng Shui. It suggests the idea of periodically adjusting the Feng Shui arrangements in a space to maintain a balanced and positive energy flow. Yes, that's it. It's our turn this time. In the past, we laughed at those guys who had no place to showcase their skills and could only help us transport supplies and provide support. But this time, we have become their support. It's indeed a Feng Shui Lun Huan situation. It certainly is quite a Feng Shui Lun Huan, but this time, it's the naval folks who will have the chance to display their might in the end. That's for sure. It won't be long before only one of the three ocean fleets remains. We have too many fleets now. Saying this, Alexei extinguished his cigarette and threw it into the trash can. We certainly have too many fleets. There are no enemies at sea now, let alone them. Even we have too many. Luo Qinian, General Luo also put out his cigarette and fell into contemplation as he looked outside the window, where robots were continuously loading cargo onto the ships. Sometimes, I even miss the days when we had separatists. Wow, that's something you shouldn't say lightly, but I understand what you mean. In the past decade or so, the status of their army, navy, and even air force had declined. From the turbulent era a hundred years ago, when humanity had just ended the nuclear war and established a unified government relying on large-scale military forces to maintain stability. To several decades ago, when there was a hidden undercurrent of terrorist attacks by separatists all over the world. And more recently, in the past 10 years, there hasn't been a single terrorist or extremist attack in the world, a state of complete peace. As time passed, the role of the military became increasingly awkward. The army was still somewhat relevant since they had criminals, large-scale criminal organizations operating in the shadows, and terrorists to target. But what about the Air Force and Navy? They truly had no purpose anymore. The last time battleships and nuclear submarines truly engaged in combat was over 80 years ago. Back then, they weren't using advanced technology. It was simply a matter of dealing with pirates and outlaws. The world has long been unified, and there are no more enemies on Earth. And if there are enemies in space, it's not the concern of the Navy. So, the Navy has always been at the bottom of the military hierarchy. But little did they know that even at the lowest rung of this hierarchy, there would come a time for them to rise. I imagine those navy guys must have jumped for joy when they saw Godzilla retreat into the deep sea. After all, that's when they can prove their worth, right? By the way, has that thing called Godzilla been found? Let's not talk about separatists. It's not a good idea in case someone is eavesdropping. Let's discuss something else, like the movements of the titans. Not yet, and I don't think we'll find Godzilla in a short period of time. Even if the Navy doesn't interfere, we still can't locate it. The average depth of the ocean exceeds 3,000 meters, 
with an area of over 370 million square kilometers. It's impossible for any human detection device to find Godzilla quickly. Even if Godzilla is enormous, it's still unlikely because the ocean is just too vast. Can we use sonar buoys? Alexei asked with some confusion, but General Luo shook his head in response. Sonar buoys? Each buoy requires several kilotons of energy. We would need hundreds of trillions of kilotons to cover the entire world's oceans. It's impossible to do it this way. So, we just sit here shaking our heads? Letting that thing that killed hundreds of thousands of us roam free? If it were up to me, I would spend as much money as needed to find Godzilla in the shortest possible time and cut off its head, placing it on the city square. Alexei raised an eyebrow, and his statement would make anyone with a basic understanding of economics burst into laughter if set outside. Spend as much money as needed? That would lead to a complete economic collapse. The losses would only increase. Even though he held the rank of Major General, he still spoke like an immature kid. However, General Luo, who listened to his words, couldn't find it amusing. Although he understood that this plan was certainly unfeasible in reality. When he thought about the wailing people and charred bodies he saw today in Graffitimony, he wanted to support Alexei's childish idea, even if it was completely detached from reality. For now, let's not dwell on these matters. Tomorrow, the Navy will conduct the first underwater search. Hopefully, they'll find Godzilla soon. I hope the Navy personnel have a sense of conscience and won't intentionally ignore it to maintain their position. All we can do now is wait. Wait until the day we find Godzilla and kill it. As he said this, General Luo lit another cigarette. His office, or rather the entire military garrison, was lacking in people. This was also due to policy factors. The garrison had become outdated, and there weren't as many separatist enemies in the world anymore. When there were more people in this place, he used to discourage smoking. But now, with fewer people, he found himself smoking. If we find it, can we defeat it? Out of the blue, Alexei suddenly asked this question, and General Luo, upon hearing this familiar question, paused for a moment, and then replied, We should be able to defeat it. At least that's what the group of researchers working on this thing told me this morning. That monster doesn't stand a chance against our current fleet. Just think about it. Even the ancient civilizations weaker than us managed to wipe out these creatures. Why can't we, who are more advanced, do the same? To General Luo's answer, Mr. Alexei obviously didn't agree much. After listening, he muttered, I don't necessarily think so, you know. The Navy personnel have never been in combat before, while we've at least fought against terrorism. But those Navy folks, they're all inexperienced recruits. And although our technology has advanced, the number of our fleet has decreased significantly. The Navy's nuclear submarines, combined in all three oceans, amount to only 30, which is less than what a single country had before a major war, not to mention the other naval forces. So, I don't think these fleets will necessarily win. Alexei expressed his doubts about whether the Navy could defeat Godzilla, and General Luo couldn't find a counterargument at that moment. In the end, they could only respond to Alexei with a classic old phrase, I don't know. Regardless, the outcome of the battle against Godzilla was not something that these two army major generals could decide. All they could do was ensure that the Navy soldiers going into battle were in the best possible condition, the condition most likely to defeat it. Apart from that, they couldn't do anything else. Tomorrow, the first underwater exploration will begin. 8. Chapter 7. Before the Operation Part 2. If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. March 18th, 2208, 1530, Port of the Hokkaido Megalopolis, Indian Ocean Fleet, Aircraft Carrier 1 Command Room. Commander, the first batch of reconnaissance submarines will return in two hours. Well, good job, young comrade. Commander-in-Chief of Joint Operations and Commander of the Indian Ocean Fleet, General Huang Xiaoyang accepted a report and said to the junior officer who handed it to him, Ah, uh, it's nothing. The junior officer, who received this commendation, stammered a bit and quickly bowed before rushing back to his post. General Huang looked at the report in his hand and pondered some things. Indeed, they didn't find it. An untimely voice came from the door of the command room. After the voice sounded, an elderly man wearing the uniform of the World United Forces, with white hair but spirited, walked in from outside. He glanced at the report in General Huang's hand, casually found a place to sit down, and said, I told you that your methods won't work, Mr. Huang. You should consider our approach. At least it would be much more efficient in finding it. No one in the headquarters dared to respond to these words, 
because the elderly man was the second in command of this joint operation, the commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet, Chester Weber. His views were contradictory to General Huang's, and this disagreement didn't just arise in the past few days. Even before they became commanders in chief, when they were both still in the Indian Ocean Fleet, they looked down on each other. After all, one was a pure naval officer, while the other had transitioned from the army to the navy. It was normal for them to have animosity towards each other. Yesterday, as soon as General Huang arrived, the two of them had significant differences in their methods of searching for Godzilla. General Huang advocated a steady and systematic approach, wanting to use unmanned submarines to conduct a thorough search in the deep sea areas where Godzilla might be hiding. The sound intensity of manned submarines was much stronger, and they didn't require a large number of unmanned vessels. In terms of efficiency, this method was better than the previous one. However, it had a safety issue. Commander Weber's proposed solution was to disperse nuclear submarine groups for the search. In other words, if Godzilla was successfully located, it could also detect the submarines and launch an attack. This was extremely unsafe for individual nuclear submarines. If one of them was destroyed by Godzilla, the losses would be tremendous. Compared to that, the unmanned vessel approach was much better. However, the efficiency of unmanned vessels was too low. There weren't enough unmanned submarines available in the world's navy to search for Godzilla. Relying solely on the existing submarines, it might take months or even longer to find it. Leaving a monster that could potentially threaten all coastal cities and sea routes unattended for months or even longer? Not everyone could accept that. General Huang, knowing the sarcastic nature of Commander Chester, didn't refute him even with a single word. He was well aware of their long acquaintance and his cantankerous temperament. If he had countered, the old man would have undoubtedly worn a mocking expression as if to say, you've lost your composure. That's how they were when they lived in the same naval dormitory before. After reading the report, General Huang called a few people over in the command room and asked about the discrepancies between this report and yesterday's projections. Why are there dozens of submarines missing? The rescue team requested some submarines this morning to weld and repair the puncture hole. It should be finished the day after tomorrow. Don't worry, we're working on it. What about the repairs on the third vessel? We're in the process of fixing it. You can rest assured that it will be repaired in the next few days. And the supplies? Nobody informed me about it. General Luo and his team delivered them. You really don't have to worry. If there are any issues, we will report them to you. They first discussed trivial matters mentioned in the report and, after confirming that there were no significant problems, General Huang instructed them to return to their workstations. Then he approached Commander Chester, who had been waiting for a while, and asked, Is your side's exercise arrangement finalized? We can't afford any delays. As he spoke, General Huang glanced at the document in Commander Chester's hand and looked at his old rival's face, saying, So, what was the outcome of the meeting? Yes, on the 23rd at 7 o'clock in the Far East time zone, the Pacific Fleet will arrive near Hokkaido for the second exercise. I showed them the scenario you devised for the confrontation, and they all agreed. Commander Chester bluntly mentioned the date. The joint exercise was the reason for his visit, to inform General Huang that their schedule was set. The joint exercise between the Indian Ocean and Pacific fleets was proposed by General Huang the previous evening. He believed that before engaging in a full-fledged battle with the monster, they should have at least one exercise to have a baseline. It wouldn't be appropriate to send a group of inexperienced soldiers who had never fired a single shot. Commander Chester agreed with General Huang's idea and also believed that at least one exercise should be conducted before the battle. Therefore, they applied to the International Committee under the World United Government for this military exercise. Finally, the exercise was approved, and Commander Chester and Commander Huang Xiaoyang immediately began arranging the time, scale, and location of the exercise. Commander Chester's visit was to inform the Indian Ocean Fleet about their arrival time and the arrangements for the exercise. The exercise was divided into three parts, the unilateral exercise of the Indian Ocean Fleet, the unilateral exercise of the Pacific Fleet, and the confrontational exercise between the Indian Ocean and Pacific Fleets. In last night's meeting, the first exercise was detailedly arranged, but the second and third exercises were not yet finalized. It was already 9 p.m. in the Far East, and it was even 1 a.m. in Hawaii where the Pacific Fleet is located. Everyone was asleep. It wasn't practical to wake everyone up for a remote meeting, so at that time, Commander Huang hastily set some items and asked Chester today if the plan was feasible. The news received now is that the plan is feasible. 
Upon hearing this news, Commander Huang breathed a sigh of relief. If it was feasible, there was no need for another meeting. He was getting tired of having meetings these days. Well then, we're good here. Shall we meet again in five days? Since it was decided to conduct the confrontational exercise between the Indian Ocean Fleet and the Pacific Fleet, Chester would definitely need to return to prepare in the Pacific Fleet. Their next meeting would probably be in five days. Don't be in a hurry. We won't part ways just yet. They think it's fine. But today I've been thinking that there are still some areas of this exercise that need to be adjusted. Chester, not in a hurry to leave, felt that certain aspects of this exercise needed to be modified. Pulling his old rival along, they had another meeting after dinner that lasted for over two hours. Boom 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 boom. Boom 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 boom. The urgent alarm sounded, startling Huang Xiaoming who was sleeping. In reflex, he put on his uniform and rushed to the command center. Report to me, what's happening? Having put on his uniform and arrived at the command center, he immediately saw the projection screen displaying a satellite image, showing a massive shadow moving beneath the surface of the sea. Godzilla had appeared. 8. Chapter 8. Before the Operation, Part 3. If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Remaining hibernate time, 0 hours, 0 minutes, 10 seconds. Hula. Remaining hibernate time, 0 hours, 0 minutes, 5 seconds. Hula. Remaining hibernate time, 0 hours, 0 minutes, 3 seconds. Hula. Remaining hibernate time, 0 hours, 0 minutes, 1 second. Snap. Hibernation complete. Evolution accomplished. In the deepest part of the Mariana Trench, within Godzilla's lair, Godzilla ended its short two-day hibernation. Roar. Stretching lazily, Godzilla emerged from its lair, standing tall in the water with a body that was even larger and more robust than before. At the same time, it summoned the system panel that it didn't know what it was, but indeed found it useful to see how much it had grown. Host name, Godzilla. Energy supply reaction magnetic confinement deuterium tritium fusion. Hibernate power 15 gigawatts. Active power 1 terawatt. Peak output 300 terawatts. Instantaneous power can reach 10 petawatts. Body size. Height 230 meters. Mass 1.5 million tons. Total length 417 meters can increase through feeding. Body composition, ultra-dense beta iron, note 1, composite carbon nanotubes, tensile strength 80 GPA, compressive strength 60 GPA, dot, breath, high temperature plasma, peak output 280 terawatts, instantaneous power can reach 9.9 .9 petawatts, dot, self-repair capability, 1000 tons slash day, that's the system panel for Godzilla after waking up from its sleep this time, its already muscular body expanded once again and its arms were no longer slender but filled with muscular bulk, though still short. The muscles on its body were now incredibly strong and terrifying, making its entire physique larger and more imposing, almost suffocating to behold. Its body underwent more than tenfold enhancements in this evolution. Carbon fiber transformed into carbon nanotubes, and the combination of aluminum silicon alloy and carbon steel became ultra-dense beta iron. The tensile strength of its muscles increased from 5 GPA to 80 GPA, an overall improvement of over 10 times, surpassing its previous self by a significant margin. The defense capability of its body soared from a few hundred MPA of carbon steel to 60 GPA, a nearly hundredfold increase, granting it armor capable of withstanding any attack in the world. Its own body also underwent expansion, with its height growing from 218 meters to 230 meters, and its total length increasing by over 10 meters. Furthermore, and more importantly, its weight skyrocketed in this evolution. It was probably due to the change in its composition. Ultra-dense iron was naturally heavy, much heavier than its previous self. In addition, there were new elements in its breath and energy supply reaction, instantaneous power. According to the panel's explanation, it was a technique similar to charging up, allowing it to unleash a stronger strike after a long period of accumulation. With so many upgraded functions, this evolution could truly be called a thorough major upgrade. Godzilla was highly satisfied with this evolution, and it would be even more satisfied if there weren't any attributes that were left behind. 5,000 tons to 1,000 tons. Among the many upgraded attributes, its self-repair capability decreased instead of increasing. From the previous 5,000 tons per day, it became 1,000 tons per day. What is self-repair capability? Simply put, it indicates how much flesh Godzilla can regenerate in a day after being well-fed. 
The change from 50 hundred tons to 1,000 tons means that previously, a wound that could be repaired in a day now takes five days to fully heal. After completing the evolution, due to the difficulty of manufacturing the materials that make up its body, its repair speed unavoidably slowed down. It is much more challenging to create aluminum silicon alloys and carbon fibers compared to beta iron and carbon nanotubes. Under unchanged conditions, the more intricate and demanding the manufacturing process, the slower the production speed, that is certain. Therefore, Godzilla's self-healing ability had to slow down significantly to meet the high standards of its body composition. Trading 4,000 tons in one evolution for all of this is still worthwhile. I won't dwell on it. Roar, roar. After admiring its new body, Godzilla let out two roars and forcefully swung its tail towards the nearby underwater cliff, testing its current strength. Cracks, fractures, and booming sounds. Just a simple strike caused countless cracks to explode on the impacted spot of the underwater cliff. Cracks varied in size, with larger ones spreading hundreds of meters down to the seabed and higher cliffs, while smaller ones formed a dense web-like pattern around the impact point, causing numerous rocks to detach from the cliff and fall into the sea. With a cracking sound, several major cracks intertwined. Then, the giant rocks, hundreds of meters high and dozens of meters thick, where the cracks were located, collapsed in a burst of dust, falling onto the seabed. Godzilla was highly satisfied with its current destructive power. In the past, if it had demonstrated its strength like this, the other titans would surely be amazed. However, they were no longer around. In its billions of years of extended life, each slumber took hundreds or even thousands of years, and every awakening meant the potential disappearance of familiar lives. Only fellow titans could survive through its countless long slumbers. But this time, its hibernation period had shortened, to the point where even those little guys wouldn't be engulfed in the torrent of time. However, the titans who had accompanied it through thousands, even tens of thousands of slumbers, were now forever beyond its reach, even though this slumber was the shortest in its life. Woo, woo. The joy that originated from its evolution was replaced by another emotion. Godzilla's low moan echoed underwater, but there was nothing to respond to it. After a brief moment of sadness, Godzilla rallied itself. It still had the planet's entrusted wish to fulfill. It had yet to drive away all the humans on this planet. Its colossal tail swayed underwater. Although its density had increased significantly after the evolution, surpassing the density of seawater, it could no longer rely on buoyancy to resurface. However, leveraging the multiplied strength, Godzilla swung its tail at a faster speed and swam towards the dark abyss, heading towards the boundless sea surface. March 19th, 2208-215 AM At longitude 151.73, latitude 25.87, we have detected Godzilla approaching the Japanese archipelago at a speed exceeding 40 knots. It is estimated to make landfall near the Tokyo metropolitan area in 17 hours. It appeared voluntarily? What is its intention? Inside the command center of the Indian Ocean Fleet's flagship in the Hokkaido metropolitan area port, chaos ensued due to Godzilla's sudden appearance. Commander Huang Xiaoming, the overall commander of the Godzilla subjugation campaign, Looked serious as he observed the shadow projected on the command center screen and issued orders. Report to the Tokyo Metropolitan Government and urge them to evacuate the Tokyo Metropolitan Area immediately. Notify the Pacific Fleet to accelerate and come to our support. Finally, Indian Ocean Fleet, launch all forces within 10 minutes. We must stop Godzilla from making landfall. Note 1. The beta iron mentioned here is not the same as the beta iron commonly known in materials science. It refers to a hypothetical new stable high-pressure phase of iron that may exist in the Earth's core. It is different from the now disproved beta iron that was believed to form during the iron working process. 5. Chapter 9. Before the Operation Part 4. If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Breaking news, according to observations by Starlink Corporation, 55 minutes ago, the World United Government officially detected the Titan Monster. Godzilla, which attacked Glophlimoni three days ago, moving towards the Tokyo metropolitan area in the Pacific Ocean. On the television, a charming woman dressed as a news anchor was reading an urgent piece of news. Twenty-five minutes ago, the World United Government dispatched the Indian Ocean Expeditionary First Fleet to intercept Godzilla, and it is expected to make contact with Godzilla and initiate the operation in eleven hours. She sat in a studio with a background of a starry galaxy delivering this urgent news with the most authentic broadcasting tone. At present, 
the Tokyo metropolitan area has initiated a large-scale evacuation. It is estimated that the entire population within 13 coastal districts will be evacuated within 10 hours, with a total evacuation of 30 million people, making it the largest population evacuation since the Agatha terrorist attack 50 years ago. Now, we will switch to the live coverage of the evacuation by our correspondent in Tokyo. Please switch to the Tokyo scene. After finishing the urgent report, the television screen shifted to an overcrowded outdoor area from the studio. All right, I am our correspondent, Fan Yushi, stationed in Tokyo. Currently, I am evacuating together with the main force from the city center of Tokyo. A beautiful female reporter stood among the crowd, providing updates on the situation to the viewers. As you can see, there are so many people here, and you can't even see the end of the crowd. Many people rushed here without grooming themselves, emphasizing the importance of evacuation for everyone in Tokyo. Although the crowd is enormous, everyone is patiently queuing in an orderly manner, waiting for the arrival of the supersonic trains. There is no congestion or stampede, and everyone is following the rules. According to our information, there are a total of 20 supersonic trains in the 13 evacuation zones in Tokyo. They are responsible for transporting the residents waiting in Tokyo to Osaka. Each train can accommodate 8,000 people, and a round trip between Osaka and Tokyo takes only 10 minutes, making it the primary means of transportation. However, the total population that needs to be evacuated from these 13 coastal zones exceeds 30 million, so relying solely on trains is not enough. All 11 airports in Tokyo are already operating at full capacity, and the seven maglev bidirectional 10-lane roads leading out of the city are also fully loaded. According to a recent report from the Tokyo Metropolitan Transportation Bureau, in the past half hour alone, there were as many as 300,000 vehicles leaving Tokyo. But this rate is still insufficient to evacuate the entire population. Therefore, just now, the Tokyo municipal government decided to convert the bidirectional lanes into one-way lanes, aiming to complete the evacuation of all people in the coastal areas of Tokyo as quickly as possible. The person next to me is the person in charge of the trains in the 8th district of Tokyo. May I ask if the trains in the 8th district are operating smoothly? With such intense transportation tonight, will there be any? Click. Slumping on the couch, Akira Akizuki turned off the television and stared at the ceiling. Has it emerged so quickly? Working continuously for 60 hours without rest, Akira Akizuki suddenly fainted during a meeting a few hours ago. He woke up leisurely only when his good friend, Erita, carried him back to his home in Hokkaido. With the rapid development of robotics technology, the rescue operations for personnel have been mostly completed in these past two days. What remains is the handling of the nuclear wasteland contaminated with radiation. Unlike the urgent nature of rescuing people before, even if he doesn't go to work for these few days, it won't cause any significant losses. So Erita told him that the intention of the members of parliament was for him to rest during these few days and go over afterward when he's fully recovered. After all, even if he works tirelessly now, he won't save any more people. It's better to take care of his own health. Akira gladly accepted this well-intentioned suggestion. But on his first day of rest at home, when he was ready to get a good night's sleep, he saw this news. Godzilla reappears. Indian Ocean Fleet takes initiative, seeking revenge for the million dead. He couldn't sleep anymore. Opening his phone, Akira started scrolling through social media. The trending topics on social media tonight were exceptionally lively, even the 3 a.m. Jito in the far eastern district had far more activity than usual daytime trends. Godzilla, Godzilla, Godzilla is here. Ah, uh, I'm a Tokyoite, and I have nowhere to stay tonight. Thank goodness I'm from Hokkaido. Kyoto residents welcome Tokyo's high school girls to stay at my place tonight. Contact information. Triple XXXXX. Why do we Tokyoites have to be so unlucky? The majority of social media posts are filled with meaningless content, consisting mostly of complaints, pleas for help from Tokyo residents who need to evacuate, and the gloating of people from other regions. There are also some Tokyo residents who express their desire to stay home tonight instead of evacuating. However, among the sarcastic remarks from internet users, there are also some people who advise against this and urge them not to take such risks. Although everyone doesn't believe Godzilla will successfully make landfall, it's always better to be cautious. Life is precious, you idiot. These words can be considered as strangers showing concern. There are still good people in this world, but there are also plenty of jerks. Godzilla taught those noble people in G-Force a lesson last time. Is he going to teach those arrogant Tokyo ghosts a lesson this time? Haha. <laughs> this tweet infuriated Akira Akazuki when he read it. 
Just as he was about to curse the person, a message appeared on the screen stating that the owner of the tweet had been permanently banned. That's more like it. After scrolling through Twitter for an hour, Akira was starting to feel tired. However, he came across a headline that caught his attention. He knew he wouldn't be able to sleep tonight. Star Chain Corporation, Godzilla Annihilation Battle, Live Broadcast. Thanks to the powerful satellite system of Star Chain Corporation, we will be tracking Godzilla comprehensively in the next 24 hours. From before the battle to the actual confrontation. Join us and witness the destruction caused by this colossal beast. It was a live stream. Organized by Star Chain Corporation, the first to discover Godzilla. This live stream featured the ongoing movements of Godzilla. Although the current view was just a blurry ocean, the outline of the shadow beneath the surface could still be seen. That was Godzilla moving forward. As Akira watched, a heavy feeling settled in his heart. He knew he couldn't sleep anymore because he had to witness it all, to watch this creature's path of destruction. Since he had decided to endure another sleepless night, he thought he might as well have a cup of coffee. With that in mind, Akira called out to a room. Okay, son, K.O. Mom, cough, ko, cough, hi, fee. He paused. His mind finally remembered one crucial fact. She was no longer there. His mother is gone. His wife is gone. His daughter is gone. They all gone. He's all alone. 3. Chapter 10 Battle Preparation in the Philippine Sea Part 1 If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon. They are 10 chapters ahead. The Indian Ocean Precedent's First Fleet Commonly known as the Indian Ocean Fleet. It is the world's second largest naval fleet, representing the absolute military power of the world united government. Over the past 80 years, it, along with the other two major fleets, has deterred countless petty individuals attempting to split from the united government. Although the main fleet has never fired a shot in direct combat, it still hangs like the sword of Damocles over the heads of separatists. And today, it will unleash its wrath upon the creature that has killed more humans than any other in the world transforming the looming sword into a tangible strike. Nine superconductive magneto-hydrodynamic propulsion submarines serve as the main combat force, supported by five anti-submarine destroyers and seven missile destroyers as secondary forces. Eight anti-submarine frigates and 22 missile frigates form the encirclement, supplemented by three main aircraft carriers, totaling 54 ships with a total displacement exceeding 500,000 tons. This formidable fleet advances at a speed exceeding 50 knots toward Godzilla's location, passing through the Nemiro Strait. Navigating the vast Pacific Ocean, they head to intercept their target at the fastest speed possible. They must not allow it to approach Tokyo. Twelve hours later, 300 kilometers from Tokyo Bay, at the junction of the Philippine Sea and the Pacific Ocean, inside the command center of the Indian Ocean Fleet's flagship carrier, Commander Godzilla is now within range of our main fleet. Should we launch the attack now? They started asking if they should initiate the attack as soon as Godzilla entered the range of their anti-submarine missiles. Commander Huang, present in the command center, nodded as he looked at the projected image of Godzilla's body and said, Launch the attack. The entire fleet will follow the preliminary operational plan discussed earlier. Surrounded according to the plan, prioritizing long-range engagement. Pound it to pieces outside of its range. Yes, sir. The fleet was well prepared for this. During the 12 hours leading up to the arrival of the Indian Ocean Fleet, detailed operational plans were formulated based on real-time satellite imagery, landing images from previous days, and a series of recommendations from overseas Titan experts and weapons specialists. With the nuclear submarines as the core force, they would conduct primary attacks within a range of 5 nautical miles using large torpedoes. Simultaneously, they would deploy a large number of naval mines in the deep sea surrounding Godzilla forcing it to endure saturation attacks in shallow waters. The destroyers would serve as secondary forces, maintaining a distance of 15 nautical miles for anti-submarine strikes when Godzilla reached shallow waters. They would drive Godzilla away, repelling it head-on through high-speed torpedoes from unmanned submarines, unmanned drones armed with small missiles, and anti-submarine missiles. Their objective was to make it leave the waters near Tokyo and head towards deeper parts of the Pacific Ocean. The frigates would split into two groups, with one group maintaining a frontal firepower position at a distance of 30 nautical miles, while the other group would flank Godzilla, placing more heavy mines behind it, preventing it from returning to the trench and escaping. Finally, the aircraft carrier, acting as the command center, would be guarded by the escorting frigates. Utilizing unmanned drones, they would drop heavy bombs, delivering a fatal blow when Godzilla resurfaced in shallow waters. 
All units, open fire. Boom, 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 boom. With the order from the commander-in-chief, all 51 warships simultaneously launched their entire payload of anti-submarine missiles from their launchers. Over a hundred anti-submarine missiles, each carrying a 400 mm torpedo with a whopping 80 kilograms of explosive material, propelled at twice the speed of sound from the warships. These torpedoes utilized immensely powerful anionic salts as their explosive charges. The power, range, speed, and accuracy of these missiles far surpassed those of the pre-war anti-submarine missiles. More than a hundred anti-submarine missiles streaked across the sky, leaving behind magnificent trails. They resembled over a hundred arrows piercing through the heavens, traversing the atmosphere at an incredible speed. About to hit the target, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, direct hit. On the satellite imagery, numerous black dots swiftly passed through the area of the sea where Godzilla's body was located. The missiles descended from the sky and plunged into the water, generating several meter high water columns directly above the spot where Godzilla's figure resided. The impact made the shadow beneath the water clearer. This was evidence of the missiles hitting their target. What's Godzilla's reaction? Did it slow down? The shadow representing Godzilla darkened once again, indicating that it was undisturbed and still moving slowly beneath the water. Although everyone anticipated that this wave of attacks wouldn't severely harm it, seeing it firsthand couldn't help but weigh on their hearts. Could this truly be considered a living being? Could any creature remain unaffected by such an onslaught? These thoughts flashed through everyone's minds, and at the same time, the personnel in the command center began accessing satellite measurements to determine if there were any changes in Godzilla's behavior after enduring this saturation. Attack. No change in speed. No change in direction. No change in depth. Could it be that the previous attack didn't even qualify as a disturbance for it? This was an explosive charge using anionic salts. Although there was a significant difference compared to the media's exaggerated claim of being 100 times more powerful, it was still several times or even 10 times stronger than TNT explosives. Over a hundred missiles of this kind could flatten all the buildings within a 300 meter diameter circle in a city. But now, this powerful weapon seemed to have no effect on this creature. Report to the commander, there have been no changes on the enemy's side. No deceleration or diving behavior, no signs of being intimidated. An observer reported to the overall commander, deviating slightly from the original plan. According to their formulated plan, while Godzilla wouldn't be heavily injured, it was supposed to sink into the depths after the attack. Titanic creatures possess this intelligence. They can discern that the threat comes from the sky, so in order to evade it, they choose to dive. Is that so? Stick to the original plan. Its failure to dive is actually advantageous for us. Destroyers and nuclear submarines advance and will provide support from the periphery. Start bombing with unmanned drones now. We need to inflict significant damage on it before it dives. We must exterminate it. Yes. After the first wave of attacks, the fleet initiated the second round of assault. A total of 150 unmanned carrier-based bombers, accompanied by 30 military unmanned submarines, closed in on Godzilla ahead of the main force. They would carry torpedoes far more powerful than before to strike Godzilla. According to the original plan, they aimed to kill Godzilla outside the Japanese archipelago. The Battle of the Philippine Sea officially began. 4. Chapter 11 Battle of the Philippine Sea Exhalation Part 2 If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Roar The Titan's roar reverberated through the depths of the sea. This was Godzilla's small reaction to the human attack just now the human assault did not prove entirely ineffective. At least it made Godzilla roar, didn't it? Godzilla swam in the vast ocean, its tail stirring the waters as it observed the fleet in the far distance, contemplating. Am I lucky? Just as I emerged, I encountered the human military. One of its secondary missions was to destroy a large-scale human force. It failed to complete that mission during its previous landfall, but this time, it should be achievable, right? Secondary mission, the mercy of the monster king. Arrogant humans always believe their weapons and military are invincible in this world. However, the Monster King has a different perspective. To make humans understand this fact, the merciful Monster King decides to demonstrate it personally. Reward. One evolution of the power supply system. Godzilla hadn't completed this mission yet. It was quite curious to see how far its evolution could progress and whether the degree of enhancement would surpass that of physical strengthening. However, compared to this mission, Godzilla actually wanted to complete another secondary mission more. 
After completing this evolution, five new missions would be added to its panel, corresponding to four directions other than the power supply system and an auxiliary function. As for that auxiliary function, Godzilla was very eager for it. Secondary mission, human nest, desolate wasteland. Humans are cunning creatures, easily hiding and regrouping once a few escape. So, destroy a human city. Ensure that the population density in the city is less than 100 humans per square kilometer. Reward, human radar, helping you locate the whereabouts of every human on Earth. This feature would be of great assistance to Godzilla's dream of driving humans out of this universe. It would strive to complete this mission. However, before that, it needed to defeat the fleet in front of it. The unmanned submarines have approached within 5 nautical miles of Godzilla. Launch high-speed torpedoes. At the other end of the sea, dozens of kilometers away, people in the command room stared nervously at the Godzilla model that had just been established using the sonar of the unmanned submarines. They issued the command to fire. Swoosh. More than 180 torpedoes, each with over 100 knots of speed, shot out from the torpedo tubes of the unmanned submarines. These small torpedoes carried a minimal amount of explosive, but their advantage lay in their tremendous speed and self-tracking capabilities, with minimal noise. Nearly 200 torpedoes shot underwater towards Godzilla, heading for its body. However, Godzilla had already sensed their trajectory using its sonar as soon as they were launched. But it had no desire to evade them and instead chose to directly withstand the impact of nearly 200 torpedoes with its own body. Boom! 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 Continuous explosions erupted on Godzilla's body, numerous bubbles burst forth, and the explosion displaced and evaporated the seawater, forming bubbles enveloping Godzilla with high temperature gas exceeding a thousand degrees Celsius. For a moment, the projection of Godzilla in the distant command room experienced slight fluctuations due to the interference caused by these bubbles. In the command room, Commander Huang and others stared at the fluctuating projection of Godzilla, waiting for the subsequent data. This projection model was a three-dimensional representation of Godzilla scanned by the sonar of the unmanned submarines, providing a detailed depiction of Godzilla's entire body. With it, they would no longer be puzzled about Godzilla's physical condition like they were when relying on satellite imagery. Through it, they could see the complete situation of Godzilla's body, where it was injured, where it was bleeding. All of this could be discerned through the sonar model. How severe are its injuries? The data came out, and Commander Huang asked the measurement officer in charge of interpreting the 3D model the most crucial question. The sonar indicates, no apparent damage to the surface. How is that possible? The observer answered the question with an incredulous expression. In the display of the 3D sonar, there were no visible signs of damage on Godzilla's exterior. How could that be possible? Accepting that it suffered only minor injuries would have been understandable. But to be completely unharmed? That was impossible. There couldn't be a material capable of achieving such a level. Hearing this answer, Commander Huang furrowed his brow. He realized that Godzilla's strength far surpassed their expectations. Originally, in their plans, these two waves of attacks were expected to at least inflict minor injuries on Godzilla, causing it to fear and change its course of action. But the reality was far from that. They hadn't even pierced Godzilla's skin. It was completely unscathed. This was definitely beyond the capabilities of aluminum silicon alloys. Their estimation of Godzilla had been mistaken. This monster was not in the same league as the previous Titans. They needed heavy firepower. Switch the submarines to heavy torpedoes. Change the ammunition for the drones as well. Don't use small missiles. Drop air-to-surface missiles directly in front of it, using maximum firepower to force it to change its direction. New orders were issued, and as Commander Huang looked at the unharmed Godzilla, he had a bad feeling in his heart. Also, contact the Pacific Fleet again and tell them to accelerate their speed. Clap. In the depths of the sea, large bubbles burst while smaller ones floated to the surface. Countless bubbles disappeared freeing Godzilla from their grip and revealing its unscathed and fierce face. Over a hundred torpedoes had blasted against its face, but not even a small dent remained. This was the evolved Godzilla's defense power. If it were composed of just bait iron, there would probably be several centimeters of small craters on Godzilla's skin from the torpedoes. Beta iron lacked resilience and would deform upon explosion, unable to restore its original shape. However, with the addition of carbon nanotubes, the rebound resilience became exceptional. The composite beta iron was slightly deformed by the explosions but was immediately pulled back into place by the carbon tubes. As a result, 
these dozens of torpedoes caused no damage to Godzilla whatsoever. As far as massages go, it was just right. That was Godzilla's evaluation of this cluster of torpedoes from humans. But right after the torpedoes, something incongruous appeared in the sky. It was a swarm of unmanned bombers launched by three aircraft carriers, preparing to drop supersized air-to-surface missiles right in front of Godzilla to force it to change direction. At the same time, several unmanned submarines several miles away had also switched their torpedoes, transforming their 400 mm, 80 kg explosive high-speed torpedoes into 600 mm, 300 kg explosive heavyweight torpedoes. Fire. Boom. Roar. The one-ton air-to-surface missiles and the heavyweight torpedoes were launched simultaneously, heading towards Godzilla's face. This time, the underwater Godzilla was no longer indifferent. It let out a resounding roar shaking the depths of the sea, and raised its head, observing the approaching air-to-surface missiles from the surface. In the face of these missiles, Godzilla's mouth emitted a light capable of illuminating the entire seabed in the next instant. The sea was parted. 3. Chapter 12 Battle in the Philippine Sea Surfacing Part 3 If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead, like the mythological parting of the sea done by Moses. In the dark depths, Hundreds of meters below, a majestic light illuminates everything, separating the lightless abyss from the eternal darkness. It exposes the vast ocean, transforming all things. Flames, several times the speed of sound, erupt from Godzilla's mouth, cutting through the murky depths towards the dark sea above. The seawater is parted. An immense amount of heat is released, instantly evaporating thousands of tons of seawater, creating an enormous gas bubble. The plasma expelled by Godzilla travels only a few hundred meters due to the water's influence before dispersing into a fiery cloud. Under extreme heat and pressure, the fiery cloud continues to expand endlessly, merging with the evaporated gas bubble. Then, in rapid expansion, it touches the surface of the sea. The ancient ocean undergoes a tremendous transformation, rupturing and bursting open under the pressure of the expanding bubble. Boom! Amidst the thunderous roar, the shallow waters are propelled into the sky by the extreme pressure of the bursting bubble. Tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of tons of seawater explode simultaneously, creating a colossal water column that connects heaven and earth. It is a magnificent sight. After the bubble bursts, the massive fireball, with a diameter of hundreds of meters, rises like a red sun from the dark depths of the sea. It defies gravity, ascending within the colossal water column, creating an extraordinary spectacle. Like a blazing sun, it rises from the sea, enveloping everything around it. The airborne missiles and the drones that launch them are engulfed by the rising sun before they can evade. The missiles detonate under the intense heat, while the unmanned bombers in the low sky are shaken by the powerful blast, barely maintaining stability. Some bombers are even brought down by the strong shockwave, plummeting from kilometers above into the sea, turning into mere scraps of metal. Godzilla looks up, witnessing the disappearance of the ocean above. Millions of tons of seawater are displaced by the bursting bubbles, pushed aside. The sea is parted above it. It gazes at the sky until the ocean engulfs it once again. Thirty-three unmanned drones have lost contact. Forty nautical miles away, inside the command center, the personnel watched in awe as the breath of Godzilla unfolded, causing their scalps to tingle. Even from such a distance, they could see with their naked eyes the sky turned crimson, several tens of kilometers away, by the blazing cloud, the sun ascending. One-fifth of the 150 unmanned aerial bombers were vaporized by this attack. Despite the several hundred meters of ocean and several kilometers of atmosphere between them, if the drones had retreated even a moment later and been struck head-on by that fireball, it would likely have been total annihilation. But this is good news. Although the power of this attack seemed immense, and indeed it was, strategically it was good news. Godzilla's breath matches our projected model with no significant deviation from our previous calculations. Fuel. Thank goodness. The personnel responsible for analyzing Godzilla's data model slowly exhaled the breath they had been holding, as they finished their calculations on the power of this breath. Their anxieties eased slightly. The power displayed by Godzilla's breath aligned closely with their pre-war assessment. If Godzilla's breath had exceeded their expectations, just like its physical capabilities, it would have been an impossible battle. But for now, they still had a chance to fight. They could still fight. Nuclear submarines and unmanned submersibles are all in position. Sea mines have been released in the front. Order the destroyers in the front to deploy deep sea mines, supporting the nuclear submarine fleet, and force Godzilla into shallow waters. 
While Godzilla engaged with the unmanned submarines and drones, nine Poseidon-class nuclear-powered submarines confronted Godzilla in the deep waters. They possessed heavier, faster super-heavyweight torpedoes compared to the unmanned submarines, as well as a large number of sea mines. Their objective was to prevent Godzilla from submerging into the deep sea and instead confine it to the shallow waters, where it would be vulnerable to attacks from the surface fleet. According to the original plan, they were supposed to encircle Godzilla once it changed direction, utilizing a hunting formation. But plans couldn't keep up with changes. After enduring the intimidating strikes from the front fleet, Godzilla showed no desire to alter its course. So they swiftly adjusted their formation, transitioning from a hunting formation to a head-on confrontation. The nine nuclear submarines released numerous sea mines, creating a dense field beneath the waters ahead of Godzilla. Simultaneously, they launched a barrage of anti-submarine missiles and their largest torpedoes, the 820mm SBN heavy torpedoes. These torpedoes, known as Super Nitrogen, carried a 700kg anionic salt explosive and could reach speeds of 80 knots underwater, enough to destroy a sea fortress with a single strike. Now, a total of 20 of these torpedoes were advancing towards Godzilla, accompanied by a barrage of anti-submarine missiles and heavy sea mines, all converging in front of it. Boom, boom, boom. Five minutes after the launch, muffled explosions reverberated in the depths of the sea. The concentrated barrage of anti-submarine missiles once again struck Godzilla's face. But just like the previous encounter, it caused no harm. The super heavyweight torpedoes were about to collide with Godzilla. Sensing their approach through sonar, Godzilla's mouth emitted a blue light as it prepared to unleash its breath. But suddenly it had a change of heart. It extinguished the light in its mouth and allowed the gigantic torpedoes to continue their advance. It felt that these little fellows were quite impressive, and they had a good sense of massage, even adjusting the pressure just right. Boom! Well, ignore that line. Twenty giant torpedoes exploded on Godzilla's face, creating an explosion that was an order of magnitude stronger than the previous missiles. Godzilla, momentarily stunned by the shockwave, paused its movement and briefly stopped swimming, sinking slightly. It's working. In the command room at a distance, the people cheered with joy. Although they couldn't see the exact condition of Godzilla's body due to the disturbance caused by the explosions, the fact that Godzilla paused indicated that the wave of heavy torpedoes had successfully disrupted its actions. Just as they celebrated, deep underwater, Godzilla carefully assessed the damage caused by the 20 heavy torpedoes and figured out a crucial point. Having realized this, Godzilla began to swim upwards, no longer staying in the deep sea but, as planned by humans, heading towards the ocean surface at a depth of over 200 meters. The shallow sea evasive operation was a success. 3. Chapter 13 Battle in the Philippine Sea Final Offensive Part 4 If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Godzilla is resurfacing. It's at 700 meters, 600 meters, 500 meters, 400 meters. It has entered the shallow sea region, within 100 meters of the sea. Its dorsal fin has breached the surface. We did it! What about the positions of the fleet? The nuclear submarine fleet is 8 nautical miles away, the frontline escort ships are 24 nautical miles away, and the destroyers are 18 nautical miles away. All fleets have been deployed. Command as you wish, Commander. As soon as the question was asked, someone immediately provided an answer. Very well, launch the final offensive. Have the escort ships and destroyers advance to a distance of 15 nautical miles and unleash all their weapons on Godzilla at the maximum range. Now that it's in the shallow sea, let's not allow it to go back down. All forces, attack. On the sea surface, the combat systems of the destroyers and escort ships had already locked onto Godzilla, hidden several dozen kilometers below the sea. Whoosh. Boom. Cruise missiles weighing 2,000 kilograms each shot out from the missile launchers soaring into the sky at a speed of Mach 10, piercing through the sky. The escort ships and destroyers swiftly emptied their missile launchers, with a cruise missile rising from the launchers every few seconds. One after another, the missiles ascended, without stopping or pause. They wished to unleash all their ammunition within a single second. The entire fleet on the sea surface launched over 200 cruise missiles at this moment, streaking through the blue sky. Descending from a world higher and more unreachable than any bird, it seemed as if a meteor shower had fallen from beyond the world, all converging on a single sea area. In the depths of the ocean, the nine nuclear submarines that had arrived within 10 nautical miles of Godzilla unleashed dozens of super-heavy torpedoes in a 
surround an attack formation. Subsequently, they began releasing other small torpedoes. Meanwhile, the other unmanned submarines around them continuously loaded and launched torpedoes, using their full firepower at this moment. Under the sky, the remaining 128 bombers, regrouped and reorganized, resumed bombing underwater. These unmanned bombers launched conventional missiles from several thousand meters above the ground, directly targeting Godzilla. Then, the unmanned drones descended rapidly, dropping a large number of airdrop munitions along with the firepower from the fleet, all assaulting Godzilla from a mere hundred meters above the surface. Stars fell like rain. The Indian Ocean fleet demonstrated astonishing coordination at this moment. They collectively employed the maximum payload and the highest number of weapons, launching a saturated assault on Godzilla. Missiles, torpedoes, airdrop munitions, every kind of weapon was launched, squeezing the space around Godzilla, leaving no gaps. This is the power of humanity. Feel it. Godzilla, located on the shallow sea surface, detected the approaching torpedoes through sonar, and its eyes caught a glimpse of the incoming threats in the sky above. So many. I underestimated them, Godzilla thought to itself. However, Godzilla had no intention of evading. Instead, it approached even closer to the sea surface, exposing its massive body to the atmosphere. Whoosh! Raising its head and breaking through the water's surface, Godzilla opened its mouth and once again faced the sky, releasing its scorching atomic breath. The sky ignited, and this time, the flame storm, unobstructed by seawater, directly set the entire sky ablaze, turning the azure ocean into a sea of hellfire. Without the dampening effect of the seawater, the coverage area of the breath's flames was at least three times larger than before. It could shoot down more drones and destroy more missiles. However, in contrast, the number of missiles launched in the fleet's all-out saturation attack far exceeded three times the previous amount. Even though the first and second waves of missile barges were completely destroyed by Godzilla's breath, the second, third, and subsequent waves of cruise missiles continued to penetrate through the scorching fireballs and fell into the depths of the ocean. Boom! Boom, 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 not just tens or hundreds of missiles. It was a saturation attack composed of a total of 2,500 cruise missiles and 800 heavyweight torpedoes from the 51 warships, plus nuclear submarines, unmanned bomber formations, and unmanned submarine formations. They all collided with Godzilla's body at this moment. Every second, dozens of bombs exploded on Godzilla's body. Every second, huge tsunamis were generated on the sea surface. Every second, the firepower could completely level city blocks several hundred meters in diameter. The fleet's all-out saturation attack struck Godzilla from the sky and the sea, relentlessly assaulting it. Dense water bubbles and explosions enveloped its entire body. The seawater left on its back when its surface evaporated due to the high temperatures. Continuous explosions covered every inch of Godzilla's body, whether on the sea surface or underwater. Underwater, Torpedoes launched from submarines from deeper waters continued to attack Godzilla's abdomen, heating the surrounding water and causing the turbulence from the bursting hot bubbles to disturb the sea, making it difficult for Godzilla to move. Countless water columns several tens of meters or even dozens of meters high were blasted up from the water, forming a spectacular scene of hundreds of pillars standing on the sea surface. It was an all-around attack, an all-around suppression. The thunderous sound of explosions reverberated through the sky representing the fleet's most powerful conventional firepower as they unleashed their entire arsenal on this giant beast. In the command room, people anxiously watched the data coming from the front lines. Godzilla didn't dive, retreat, or move its tail, which had stopped swaying. It didn't continue its breath attack after the second one. Although they couldn't directly detect the detailed condition of Godzilla's body due to the impact of the shockwaves from the explosions, and they couldn't directly capture its appearance at this moment due to the spreading nuclear fireballs. Analyzing Godzilla's behavior based on the vague sonar scans, there was no doubt that their attacks had significantly impacted Godzilla. The attack was effective. The attack was effective. This is how it should be done. No. This is the only way to do it. Explosions. 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 One explosion after another burst open on Godzilla's body sometimes even blasting through the 100 meter deep sea surface, exposing Godzilla's entire body to the atmosphere. Continual explosions even stirred up the sea surface, causing the ocean to tremble. Under the relentless onslaught, Godzilla had no choice but to let the explosions twist its body on the sea surface. It had completely lost its ability to fight back. 
The sky and the ocean continuously triggered explosions in front of and behind Godzilla. The sea churned, and Godzilla trembled, unable to launch a counterattack. This was humanity's total assault. 3. Chapter 14 Battle in the Philippine Sea Silence 5 If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Don't let your guard down. It may not be dead yet. Deploy unmanned vessels to lay proximity mines in its path. We must block its last escape route. In the command room furthest away, the people, despite their excitement from the continuous barrage, maintained their basic judgment. They hadn't gone crazy to the point of thinking that the giant monster was dead just because they carried out a saturation attack. Godzilla can now be said to be temporarily stunned, unable to react quickly and unable to control its body. Once it regains its senses, it will definitely choose to dive into deep water to avoid attacks on the surface. Therefore, to block its possibility of diving, they need to approach Godzilla with unmanned submarines within the range of its underwater breath and, at the risk of losing the submarines, deploy a sufficient number of naval mines to prevent Godzilla from diving. This way, it can only endure the attacks in shallow waters. If they cannot deploy naval mines, they would have to resort to suicide attacks to deter Godzilla and keep it in shallow waters. The unmanned submarines quickly dive to the deepest depths, reaching the vicinity of Godzilla. Then they release all the naval mines they are carrying, creating a large minefield beneath Godzilla. With nearly a thousand powerful mines, more destructive than missiles, blocking Godzilla's path to dive, victory is assured. Godzilla has now become a captive of humankind. It's over. In the command center, people observe every move of Godzilla. After confirming that Godzilla showed no signs of further movement after being subjected to saturation attacks for 14 seconds, most of the people here finally breathe a sigh of relief. They start chatting. Phew, we finally won. I wonder what happened to Wang Kai. Let's go for a drink, Commander. We should celebrate this victory in style. We're getting the budget. Godzilla remains silent and stops advancing. This immediately lightens the atmosphere on the ship and everyone starts chatting and joking. Even some young generals, who are here to gain experience, are pulling the commander Huang's leg. Huan, when we go back, my daughter will turn one year old. Can you come over? I want you to draw lots for her, and I hope she'll draw yours. Let's not rush. Let's talk about it after we get back. Thank you so much. With you drawing the lots, my daughter will definitely be blessed in the future. Commander, after this mission, would you be interested in attending my brother's wedding? He has admired you for a long time. I'll see which day it is when we go back. The battle isn't over yet. Juan, my father wants to talk to you about something after we return. As the planner of the Godzilla extermination plan, Commander Juan's position will undoubtedly rise after this mission. Most of the young generals come from influential families, where their relatives are either senators or urban district leaders. They also attended yesterday's meeting and know the importance of Commander Huang's role in the plan and his contributions. It is expected that after Commander Huang returns, he will further advance his career and may even become the commander-in-chief of the future fleet. At that time, Commander Huang will not just hold a symbolic position equivalent to a senator but will truly be comparable to a district councillor. Many people will try to win over Commander Huang when he returns. It will be too late to make such requests at that time, so it's best to schedule meetings while still at sea. Everyone wants to get close to the commander who led the operation against Godzilla to seek his support and assistance. To these people, Commander Huang responds with, Now is not the time for discussions. We'll talk in detail once we're on land. It's not that he dislikes these young generals, but he genuinely feels that the matter is not yet over. There is still a faint sense of disharmony lingering in his mind. He can't help but feel that something is not right. This battle shouldn't have ended so easily. What? What did we miss? What did we do wrong? As he ponders, Commander Huang's brow furrows. He goes over everything the fleet has done in his mind, and he can't recall any mistakes they made. So is this feeling of unease just an illusion? After looking at the data a few more times, the observer's faces suddenly change. What's happening? Commander Huang walks up to the observers, his expression tense. He still feels like he missed something, but no matter how hard he tries, he can't remember what it might be. After taking another look at the data, the observers say, something unexpected. Godzilla's body temperature is rising. It's highly likely that our artillery fire breached its outer shell, causing its fusion reactor to go haywire. It. It's probably going to die. Just temperature rise? What else? Besides the temperature rise, it's probably going to explode. But even if it does, it won't affect our fleet. 
We are at least 20 nautical miles away from its fleet, so the explosion won't reach our ships. The observers aren't as nervous as before. They have seen similar events in the literature on the Titan creatures, where a rapid increase in body temperature indicated a reactor meltdown and the death of the Titans. Some of them even caused violent explosions when they went out of control. The current Godzilla is most likely in a similar state. From the rapid temperature rise on its surface, they can infer that its internal structure has been melted beyond recognition. For those who understand physics, the sudden increase in Godzilla's body temperature is further evidence of its impending demise. However, the debris from the explosion might affect the ships. Commander, should we temporarily cease fire and create some distance? All right. Without hesitation, Commander Huang agrees to the proposal. The feeling of unease within him grows stronger. He orders the entire fleet to temporarily cease fire, change direction, and create some distance. The destroyers, frigates, and submarines start to withdraw. Everyone assumes that Godzilla is already dead. After all, there has been no response for more than 10 minutes. If it were still alive, it wouldn't be behaving like this. As the fleet retreats, the underwater area where Godzilla's body is located is no longer disturbed by the sonar from the shockwaves. The sonar of the unmanned submarines can now detect detailed information about Godzilla. The extent of the damage to Godzilla's body underwater, the damage. The observers receive detailed information about Godzilla's body after the shockwaves from the unmanned submarines no longer interfere. They want to see the extent of damage that humanity's most powerful conventional firepower has inflicted on the monster. However, the moment they see the data, everyone freezes in shock. How is this possible? Surface deformation, 1.3%. How is it possible? It only suffered minor damage from such intense bombardment. If it only suffered minor damage, why is its temperature like this? According to the new model, after enduring a full 10 minutes of saturation attacks, Godzilla's surface only suffered a minor 1.3% damage. It's almost as if it's completely unharmed. People are left dumbfounded by this result and fall into a state of despair. If it remains unharmed like this, what methods do we have to harm it? We can't defeat it at all. That's what most people think. But some individuals, like the data observers, consider something else. Since it's unharmed and its reactor is unlikely to be fundamentally affected or out of control, why is Godzilla's body temperature rising? The waters around Godzilla are evaporating. How is this possible? Its temperature is still increasing. Didn't its reactor suffer no damage? In the end, why did this creature stop moving? Didn't it receive any injuries? The surface temperature exceeds 600. No, 700 degrees. It's still rising. How is this possible? How is it possible? What is Godzilla doing? What's happening inside its body? Any materials should have melted at this temperature. So why is its reactor still functioning? Godzilla, what are you doing? The observers shout in disbelief, their faces filled with incredulity. And at this moment, Commander Huang finally realizes the source of that dissonance. No wonder he couldn't find the source of it in their fleet's operations. After all, it wasn't about them at all. They hadn't done anything wrong. It was Godzilla who had done something wrong. Notify the entire army to evacuate from Godzilla as quickly as possible. Its attack is coming. 3. Chapter 15. Battle in the Philippine Sea. Unveiling Part 6. If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon. They are 10 chapters ahead. Vast amounts of heat are converging. Countless flames gather and compress within its own body. The fusion light intensifies in its depths. Inside Godzilla's body, the fusion reactor, which has already been compressed and heated to its limits, is once again compressed, further increasing the temperature. The high-energy neutrons generated by nuclear fusion bombard Godzilla's body, causing the inner walls of its fusion reactor to melt and sublime. Even though the internal metal walls have been reinforced by a powerful magnetic field generated by nuclear fusion, and even though the fusion reactor has fully utilized the plasma flames to contain the energy of high-energy neutrons and radiation. But now, at this moment, with the accumulated energy in Godzilla's fusion reactor far surpassing its previous state, the inner walls of the fusion reactor inevitably begin to melt. All the cooling fluid inside has been transported to this area. Most of the cooling fluid from the first fusion reactor has already been drained, leaving Godzilla with only the bare minimum energy for survival. The casing is cooling at full power, and the carbon nanotubes are conducting heat at full capacity. But it's all in vain. Even though Godzilla is using plasma flow to intercept most of the high-energy neutrons through collisions with extreme precision, it's futile. Because at this moment, the energy inside Godzilla's body is too immense. 
Godzilla doesn't have just one fusion reactor, it actually has two. One is the power supply fusion reactor that provides energy for its movements, while the other is the breath fusion reactor specifically used for its breath attack. The former has lower intensity and a maximum power of only a few terawatts, but it can sustain continuous output. The latter has extremely high intensity, and its maximum power can reach several hundred terawatts. However, it cannot sustain continuous output. It can only expel the flames of the core at the moment of ignition. Not only are their locations different, but their principles are also completely different. The principle of the survival reactor relies on the metal layer inside the fusion reactor, which is heated by high-energy neutrons and thermal radiation generated by fusion. The liquid behind the indirectly heated metal layer evaporates and expands, driving the generators inside Godzilla's body. This allows the conversion of thermal energy into kinetic energy, which is then converted into electrical energy. In simple terms, it's like boiling water, except the liquid being heated is not necessarily water but some liquid metal. That's the working principle of Godzilla's survival reactor, while the breath reactor is completely opposite. If the survival reactor requires the nuclear reactor to heat it as much as possible to obtain energy, the breath reactor aims to prevent the nuclear reactor from heating the metal walls and instead gathers the heat within the plasma, rather than releasing the heat. As for why it's done this way, it's because the power of the breath reactor is extremely high. With a maximum power of 300 terawatts, if heat transfer through the casing is used, there are no materials currently available that can continuously withstand such a tremendous amount of energy without melting. The inner walls of Godzilla's fusion reactor have a surface area of just over a thousand square meters, which is entirely incapable of sustaining a continuous power output of 300 terawatts. So, the principle of the breath reactor is not to draw energy from the nuclear reactor and use it to heat the gas released from the mouth. Instead, it ignites and heats the plasma using gamma rays accumulated by the survival reactor, maintaining a certain intensity. Then it accelerates them in one direction to form a plasma vortex. Subsequently, when the velocity and pressure in the plasma vortex reach a limit, a large amount of fuel with great momentum in the direction of the breath is poured in, causing the fusion reactor to combust instantaneously. At the same time, the survival fusion reactor is overclocked to generate a super strong electromagnetic field, at least restraining them within the thousandth of a second when the plasma is expelled. There's no accumulation of energy, no gathering involved. The breath is just that simple and brutal. This process only lasts a few seconds, a dozen at most, unlike the continuous operation of the survival reactor. In addition, the breath reactor's powerful magnetic field causes the plasma in the breath reactor to be much denser than in the survival reactor, restricting the movement of high-energy neutrons and internal photons. It's the combination of these multiple factors that prevents the breath reactor from melting due to the high-temperature breath and enables Godzilla to use its breath, which can easily destroy a city. But now, today, at this very moment, the power of the breath is no longer enough. Those little things are indeed clever. They calculated the range of my breath and attacked me from beyond that range. They must have realized the range of my breath when I destroyed that city. You are very intelligent indeed, but it doesn't matter, because it will overclock. 300 terawatts is ultimately the limit of Godzilla's atomic breath without harming itself. However, if Godzilla were to use its breath under the premise of damaging its own body, its power would increase significantly. This is a technique Godzilla has possessed since its birth. It has used this move to defeat enemies much stronger than itself, making it its ultimate skill. But there is one drawback. This move causes significant damage to Godzilla's body, rendering its atomic breath reactor unusable for a considerable amount of time. However, that was in the past. This evolution has given Godzilla a stronger physical composition and a method to make the ignited plasma denser. It can greatly reduce the number of high-energy neutrons and thermal radiation colliding with the metallic wall minimizing self-damage to Godzilla. With this ability, Godzilla can increase its instantaneous power to a level that previously required self-inflicted injuries. Of course, it requires a period of charging. Although fundamentally speaking, this cannot be called charging. It is merely a matter of spending time adjusting the density of the plasma. Once the density of the plasma is properly adjusted, more fuel can be added, allowing the instantaneous power to reach a terrifying level without causing significant harm to Godzilla itself. In theory, Godzilla only needs 1 to 2 minutes to adjust the beam's power. However, it has been more than 10 minutes, and it remains motionless. As for why? Well, it's because Godzilla can't activate it. Really? What should be done to achieve it? 
Why isn't there an auxiliary ignition? Although the system panel has instructions on using a magnetic field to make the plasma ultra dense, but some things cannot be easily accomplished just by having instructions. In the end, this is Godzilla's first time attempting this, and it's normal to be unfamiliar with it. Finally, it's done. After more than 10 minutes of fiddling, Godzilla feels the inner wall no longer getting hotter, realizing that it has finally adjusted the plasma density correctly. During those 10 minutes, it maintained the atomic breath reactor at power levels of tens or even hundreds of terawatts. This greatly exceeded its capacity, resulting in the heating of its entire body and the melting of the reactor's inner wall. If Godzilla didn't have two fusion reactors and a sufficiently robust cooling structure, it would have burned itself to death during its previous attempts. Compared to the damage inflicted by the attacks of the smaller entities outside, the damage caused by Godzilla's own failed attempts is even greater. But it's fine now, I'm finally ready. I finally understand how to bind it. On the surface of the sea, Godzilla, which was previously motionless, began to move again. It opened its eyes, sensing the position of the human fleet. Then, facing into the distance, it opened its mouth. The Divine Punishment Beam emerged. 3. Chapter 16 Battle of the Philippine Sea Destruction Part 7 Conclusion If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Godzilla opened its mouth. It sensed the positions of the fleets of the smaller entities in the distance, and then covered its eyes with its nictitating membranes. In the next moment, the sky turned dark, infinite and boundless. A light of ultimate intensity that cannot be described with any number of words illuminated the entire sea in that instant. The sky turned dark. In the far distance, 25 nautical miles from Godzilla's location, at the command center, people looked at the sky, which had turned extremely dark, and the extreme light in the black sky, their faces filled with confusion. What was that? That was, get down, someone realized. But it was already too late. The sea roared, and the sky was dyed black by the light of ultimate intensity. The beam of ultimate fire, exceeding Mach 100 in speed, crossed a distance of over 15 nautical miles in less than a second, directly hitting a destroyer at the rear left of the fleet. It hit the fleet. What happened after it hit? Did it create towering waves? Did it boil the entire sea? Or perhaps a colossal water pillar? No, none of those. All that happened was a silent expansion. The super-concentrated plasma completely exploded in this instant, and Tokyo, which had just seen the sunrise 300 nautical miles away, was once again plunged into darkness. A massive fireball expanded at a speed surpassing sound, enveloping the midsection of the destroyer fleet in a silent and stillness. With a diameter exceeding 2 kilometers, the fireball brought darkness to the fleet. The supersonic shockwave, surpassing the speed of sound, rushed in all directions amidst the silence. Within a radius of 4 kilometers, it would inflict devastating blows to all vessels, killing 90% of the personnel inside. However, these shockwaves were too slow. Compared to Godzilla's breath, they were too slow. Godzilla's breath is not a momentary attack, and its impact is not limited to a single location. Turning its head, Godzilla used the impact point as a reference and turned to the right. Several massive fireballs simultaneously rose indicating the impact of its breath on solid objects. The rising of each fireball represented the disappearance of a section of the fleet and the loss of lives. The wall of fire, several kilometers high and still rising, broke through the atmosphere like a towering wall of flame, standing over the entire sea, enveloping the entire fleet. The sea reacted belatedly as the fireballs exploded, and waves dozens of meters high spread outward along with the shockwave, beyond the area covered by the explosion. They formed a towering water wall, engulfing the blown away ships, the melting metal fragments, and the remains of some individuals reduced to mere debris, spreading in all directions. If people witnessed such enormous waves on any other day, they would undoubtedly be astonished. But in this place, at this moment, these waves were insignificant compared to the wall of fire that tore through the sky. Hundreds of kilometers away, people in Tokyo Bay who hadn't had time to evacuate looked at the wall of fire on the horizon brighter and hotter than the sun, and had countless words in their hearts, but in the end, no one spoke. It wasn't just Tokyo Bay or the Far East region. The whole world fell into silence as they watched the scene. The battle between Godzilla and the Indian Ocean Fleet was being broadcast live globally, and people had expected to witness their victory. But the result was, side mission, mercy of the Monster King, completed. Reward, one evolutionary upgrade for the power system. Would you like to use it now?
The wall of fire separated the two skies and consumed everything, like a punishment the Almighty delivered to Sodom and Gomorrah. The wall of fire was awe-inspiring, but its creator didn't have much feeling about it. Compared to this wall of fire, what it cared more about was completing the mission. Now all the fleets of the smaller entities have been destroyed. Godzilla, back underwater, looked at the mission prompt on its control panel and felt the damage to its breath fusion reactor. Ah, the breath fusion reactor won't be usable for a few days. Did this high power breath cause extraordinary damage to its breath fusion reactor? Feeling the damage, Godzilla wasted too much time for the first time, stretching what should have taken 1 or 2 minutes to 12 or 20 minutes. As a result, the breath reactor, which originally wouldn't have suffered significant damage, is now completely scrapped and impossible to repair without a certain amount of time. Should it evolve first underwater before going ashore? After thinking about it, Godzilla decided to go ashore directly. After all, human weapons cannot severely harm it, and even though it can't use the breath reactor for its breath, it can still use the life-sustaining reactor. The life-sustaining reactor can sustain a limit of 3 to 5 terawatts, and using it for breath attacks, although it may not reach the level of paralyzing a city with a single strike, would still be more than enough to destroy a city block. There is still plenty of fuel inside it, and with a breath of 3 to 5 terawatts, it can spew out tens of thousands of attacks at least without affecting its own movement. These breath attacks should be more than enough to level a city. With that in mind, Godzilla swam towards Tokyo. Naturally, its memories included all the information about humans, including details about their habitats, and even information about countries. Tokyo, the largest human settlement in the sea region where Godzilla resided. If it wanted to drive humans out, starting here would be a good choice. Swinging its tail, Godzilla advanced underwater feeling comfortable on the surface without humans. A few surviving nuclear submarines located several nautical miles away launched torpedoes. Aren't they running away? Feeling the attacks from the remaining submarines on sonar, Godzilla was somewhat surprised. It thought all these small entities had fled. Its entire fleet was destroyed with a single blow? Even such a saturation attack couldn't harm me? You have no chance of winning anymore, so why not run away and wait for an opportunity? That's what it thought. Then it evaded the torpedoes launched by the submarines. Godzilla no longer had the power for a super-powered breath attack, and it didn't have a new mission to annihilate the military. In that case, I won't chase after you, mainly because it was impossible to pursue them underwater. Its cruising speed was only about 40 knots, and underwater, it couldn't catch up to the submarines created by these small entities. If it can't chase them, then it won't. After thinking for a moment, Godzilla ignored the submarines ahead and headed straight for Tokyo. It increased its speed to the maximum, and six hours later, Godzilla landed in Tokyo Bay. Under the twilight sky, Godzilla's towering body made the world tremble. 3. Chapter 17 The Day of Destruction in Tokyo If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. The whole world was watching Godzilla. When Godzilla was first discovered by Monarch, Many media outlets broadcasted the event through satellites outside the atmosphere. The United Government did not prevent this from happening. They wanted to demonstrate their power to the world. Until now, the entire fleet was annihilated, and Godzilla successfully landed in Tokyo Bay. Under the setting sun, the world witnessed Godzilla, and Tokyo Bay, once bustling, now stood empty. Boom! Emerging from the sea, Godzilla stepped on the concrete of Tokyo Bay, gazing at the buildings around it larger than its own body, and thought, is this the nest of those small entities? Having just landed on shore, Godzilla wasn't in a hurry to destroy anything. It could sense that there were no humans present in the surrounding buildings. Besides, it was the first time it had seen these modern human-made nests up close, so it was quite curious about them. After all, there was no time limit for its mission. Godzilla walked on Tokyo Bay, and its astonishing weight made the ground tremble with each step it took. Although it caused vibrations, no area collapsed under Godzilla's weight, except for the instant impact when it first stepped on. The land constructed by humans was quite sturdy. Godzilla's own footprint was a circle with a diameter of 40 meters, and it had two feet, so the total area was 2,500 square meters. Dividing its weight by that, we can calculate that the pressure exerted on the ground beneath its feet was 6.4 megapascals MPa, equivalent to 64 kilograms per square centimeter. It sounds heavy. But the compressive strength of pre-nuclear war concrete surfaces was over 30 MPa, and post-nuclear war asphalt roads had a strength of around 10 MPa. So weight wasn't an issue. 
Tokyo is filled with 300 meter and 400 meter tall buildings, and Godzilla roamed through the city. Its massive body collapsed one small building after another. Its footsteps crushed the asphalt roads and the motorcycles on them, leaving behind cracks. It smashed skyscrapers without hesitation, trampling on human creations, occasionally destroying a high-rise building. This is the typical scene in monster movies, where a creature rampages through a bustling city, destroying everything in its path, and humans could only watch, powerless to do anything about it. The above is how Godzilla's actions were perceived by humans, but in Godzilla's own eyes, it was just sightseeing. Godzilla looked around, carefully observing human creations. The more it looked, the more amazed it became. There were small vehicles that could carry them and fly. There were trains and tunnels, about half its length but much faster than itself. And there were those tall skyscrapers taller than itself. Because it was the first time it had seen them, Godzilla even dismantled a few to examine their structures. Some of them collapsed during the process, burying it underground. But a few were successfully dissected by Godzilla revealing their internal structures. Truly intricate little things, it thought. It evaluated them as such. It wandered through the city like an ordinary person, discovering many things within, but without anyone to share its findings with. Collapsing houses, crushing motorcycles, shattering skyscrapers, things that humans saw as acts of hostility. But for Godzilla, they were merely unintentional actions. It hadn't decided to destroy Tokyo yet. At least, it would explore enough before setting it ablaze. Godzilla roamed through Tokyo, continuously toppling buildings with its colossal body, paying no mind as it continued forward. Tonight, Tokyo was silent. No vehicles, no pedestrians, only a monster named Godzilla, being watched. Haven't found it. After searching within the Tokyo area for a while and confirming that Tokyo Tower was indeed gone, Godzilla shook its head and prepared to commence its destruction activities. Originally, I wanted to destroy Tokyo Tower, just like in those human monster movies. But it turns out that humans themselves blew it up with their nuclear war. Today, Tokyo is without Tokyo Tower. Connected by fusion reactors, Godzilla looked out at the urban cluster ahead and began its own destruction. Hot flames spewed from its mouth, not like the fusion reactor's breath that directly poured out fusion plasma. Instead, it absorbed energy from the fusion reactors, heating a certain area to high temperatures and then expelling it, just like the monsters in ordinary monster movies. Godzilla didn't have an abundance of nuclear fuel to spew its breath tens of thousands of times. This breath, with its 3 to 4 terawatts of power, could be heated and expelled using other substances. If it couldn't find something to heat, it would casually eat some dirt or swallow seawater. Flames continuously gushed from Godzilla's mouth, but they were slower than its previous breath and didn't converge like before. They were ordinary, outward expanding high temperature flames. As soon as they were expelled, they spread hundreds of meters forward, engulfing all the buildings within a few hundred meters in a sea of fire. The instantly spreading flames directly shattered the buildings ahead, blowing their skeletons and debris several kilometers away, turning the entire area into an inferno. As it walked, Godzilla unleashed its flames, slowly moving through Tokyo, incinerating everything in its path. Buildings hundreds of meters high were directly blown open by the flames, turning into melted debris scattered in the air. The asphalt roads below them were sublimated, creating high-temperature steam, raising the surrounding temperature to a terrifying degree. Moving forward and spewing flames, Godzilla's current action was different from its breath. This time, the flames were continuous, constantly expelled. With each sweep, Godzilla turned the entire fan-shaped area hundreds of meters ahead into a sea of fire. Dozens of high-rise buildings collapsed, while low-rise houses continued to burn. It advanced at a moderate pace pushing through the entirety of Tokyo, with a sea of fire surrounding it. Its breath returned human creations to their primal state. Boom! House after house turned into ruins as Godzilla turned Tokyo into a hell of crimson. It was somewhat regrettable. As it destroyed these intricate creations, Godzilla felt a sense of loss. Metal melted, rocks sublimated, and every now and then, a high-temperature pillar of flame, hundreds of meters long and dozens of meters thick, swept through the distance, causing massive explosions engulfing the surrounding space, turning them into crimson. This was the immense power possessed by Godzilla, dyeing the entire Tokyo red during the night. On the horizon, the sun rose once again, and at this moment, as Godzilla engulfed the entire Tokyo in an endless sea of fire, a voice echoed in its mind. After the voice echoed, Godzilla looked at the burning Tokyo that had endured for a day and night. Without looking back, it walked towards the sea and submerged back into the depths. Today, Tokyo was destroyed. 
3. Chapter 18. The Second Evolution. If you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Godzilla returned to the ocean and began preparing for its next evolution. It had continuously unleashed its breath for a whole night, reducing the entirety of Tokyo to ruins. Now Godzilla's nuclear fuel was running low. It would be too difficult for it to destroy another city defended by a human army. It decided to retreat and make adjustments before coming out again. Having completed two missions, Godzilla returned to the sea through Tokyo Bay. Once in the ocean, relying on its sonar, Godzilla detected another human fleet and several nuclear submarines dozens of nautical miles away from itself. However, that fleet didn't attack it. Instead, it followed from behind, trying to find its dwelling place. Godzilla was indifferent to this. It didn't believe that humans had the ability to directly attack the depths of the Mariana Trench, perhaps dropping a large nuclear bomb. But the effectiveness of a nuclear bomb in the depths of the trench, it could only be described as a tragedy. Slowly swimming beneath the sea, disregarding the fleet that stealthily followed behind, Godzilla once again submerged into the deep sea and returned to its home. The nuclear submarines and others didn't descend into the Mariana Trench after it re-entered. Human submarines can only dive to a depth of 2,000 meters, unable to enter the waters where its home was located. Two missions completed this time. Side mission, the merciful monster king, completed. Side mission, human stronghold, where no grass grows, completed. Reward, human radar, evolution of the power supply system. Note, this evolution requires a total of 240 hours. During this period, the host will enter the deepest sleep. Please proceed with the evolution only when everything is secure. Looking at its gains this time, Godzilla felt that it had come closer to driving humans out of the earth and reshaping this planet. The control panel also shared this sentiment. Main mission, drive humans out of this universe. Those damn humans destroyed the ecosystem of this planet. As the representative of this planet, for the sake of all the deceased beings, Godzilla, unleash your atomic breath against humans. Drive them out of this universe. Current completion, 1%. Reward, advanced materials, advanced power supply, planetary ecosystem reshaping. Its progress in the main mission increased by a whole percentage point, undoubtedly boosting Godzilla's confidence. We need to expedite the process of driving humans out of this universe. Determined, Godzilla glanced at the remaining tasks before its slumber. It wanted to see what it needed to do after completing this evolution to swiftly destroy humanity and fulfill its mission. Side mission nuclear reign. Humanity takes great pride in its nuclear weapons. They represent the power of the sun. But does this power truly affect the monster king? Please prove it and show humans your might. Reward. Evolution of body strength. Hmm, this mission rewards a body evolution. Since Godzilla made such significant progress in its evolution this time, it eagerly desired to complete this task. However, whether or not nuclear bombs are used is trivial. Therefore, the likelihood of completing it in a short time is low, as the small beings are reluctant to employ nuclear weapons after experiencing nuclear warfare. If this is not feasible, then on to the next task. Side mission, Majestic King. Is destroying one city enough to showcase the might of the Monster King? Destroy more cities at once. In a single rampage, destroy at least two human cities and show humans your endurance. Reward. Evolution of body size. This mission is straightforward. Once this evolution is complete, Godzilla believes it can certainly accomplish it. However, is a body size evolution really useful? Nevertheless, it still means becoming stronger, which is better than nothing. After all, if the body size increases, the nuclear reactor will also become larger, resulting in greater power output. Side Mission, Incarnation of Destruction Bring despair upon humans, as the incarnation of destruction individually destroy a naval fleet, an army unit and an Air Force base, reducing everything to ashes. Completed, January 3rd. Reward, Evolution of Breath Attack. This task is not difficult. There should be some army units and Air Force bases in the Far East region. Once Godzilla ravages the Far East region, it can complete this mission during the next rampage. Moreover, it is quite interested in the evolution of its breath attack. Isn't the power of the breath attack determined by the reactor? Since the reactor has evolved, what aspect of the breath attack will evolve? Godzilla is intrigued by this. The final task is the simplest. Side mission, the immortal monster. Modern weapons are believed to be capable of killing all life on Earth. At least that's what they think. But when faced with the pinnacle of this planet's 4.6 billion years of existence, can they still succeed? 
inflict enough damage to show them the error of their ways. Monster King, endure enough firepower without dying. Current completion, 34%. Reward, evolution of regeneration ability. This is the simplest task among the four for Godzilla. It only requires being hit to complete. Unlike being hit by a nuclear bomb, there is no risk of a mishap. Conventional weapons are nothing more than tickles to Godzilla. When Godzilla previously resurfaced to endure the onslaught of human attacks, it had the idea of completing this task. It even measured the power of heavy weapons in the hands of humans. Once it was certain that they would not cause any harm, Godzilla resurfaced, charging its power while taking the hits. However, even after enduring the attacks for over 10 minutes, it didn't complete the task. But despite not completing it this time, the progress bar moved a little over one third. Therefore, Godzilla believes that it can also accomplish it in the next landing. Surely the firepower humans unleash upon it during the next attack won't be weaker than the previous one, right? Godzilla has confidence in humans and believes that it has a high probability of completing this task in the next landing. Humans can help accomplish it without Godzilla even lifting a finger. After assessing the tasks it can complete, Godzilla realized that it should be able to accomplish the majority of them in the next landing, earning three opportunities for evolution. In other words, after the next landing, it will undergo a qualitative transformation. With this in mind, Godzilla simulated its next advancement route and finalized its future plans. It began its evolution and entered a deep sleep, once again submerged in the depths of the Pacific Ocean. While tranquility reigned on this side, things were entirely different on the human side. At this moment, chaos erupted. 3. Chapter 19 After the Destruction Next, if you want to see more chapters in advance, you can just click my Patreon, they are 10 chapters ahead. Kazumi, I'm sorry. It's alright. If anything, it's better now. Although Chester, who took command of the naval battle against Godzilla, had successfully evacuated the entire population of Tokyo in time, resulting in zero casualties, the Navy. 8,950 people. That was the total number of casualties in the battle against Godzilla. Except for three aircraft carriers serving as the command center at the farthest distance, and nine nuclear submarines underwater. The rest of the fleet was reduced to scrap under Godzilla's attack. Although a few partially intact warships barely survived in the outermost area, only exposed to the shockwave, there was no one left inside them. Godzilla's breath attack obliterated the entire Indian Ocean fleet, becoming history. After yesterday's attack, the world was left speechless and in awe of Godzilla's immense power. The breath attack that wiped out an entire fleet, and the ongoing inferno that burned Tokyo continued to inspire fear and trembling worldwide. To prevent the fear from escalating further, all forms of communication on the internet had been completely banned. The world government is racking their brains trying to figure out how to deal with Godzilla. All armories are in full production, manufacturing various bombs, armaments, ships, and tanks at the fastest pace possible. A massive amount of weapons is being transported to this island in the Far East, and naval forces from around the world have been deployed. Research submarines are being added every hour. Humans have filled the Mariana Trench, where Godzilla submerged, with various detectors, witnessing every move of the currently dormant Godzilla with their own eyes. This time is completely different from the last. Last time, humans couldn't react in time and couldn't even find Godzilla. It was impossible to take down Godzilla as quickly as they wanted. But this time, humans are fully prepared. Not only have they reacted, but they have also followed Godzilla's movements and discovered its lair. However, this time, no one wants to wake Godzilla up. All their activities in the Mariana Trench are guided by the principle of not allowing Godzilla to awaken. Humans have never been so cautious. Countless monitoring submarines are observing Godzilla's actions in the deepest depths of the ocean. Unmanned submarines are setting up super-heavy torpedoes at a depth of 10,000 meters. Nuclear submarines are patrolling the upper layers of the sea. On the surface, six aircraft carriers are on standby 30 nautical miles away from Godzilla. Hundreds of destroyers and frigates are on high alert, guarding the awakening of the monster beneath the sea. Today's humans are nothing like the bold ones from a few days ago. They are deeply afraid of awakening the monster king and plunging themselves into the abyss. People feel like they are walking on a tightrope, at risk of falling at any moment. Commander Chester, greetings. I am Hiroso Sato, the chief commander of the Eastern Region Army. I am Ryo Akizuki, in charge of emergency management in Hokkaido. I am Michitaka Detani, Minister of Information Industries in Oita Prefecture. I am. As Chester walked out of the corridor, several individuals in suits noticed him and immediately ran over to introduce themselves. 
They were members of the department newly involved in the Godzilla extermination operation, Chester's new colleagues. However, unlike the naval forces targeting Godzilla, their role was to execute the defense of the local front lines. Their responsibility was to protect the remaining two major metropolitan areas and five independent cities in the Far East from Godzilla's damage. In a sense, they were not on the same path as Chester, but courtesy had to be reciprocated. Nice to meet you, Mr. Hiroso Sato, Mr. Ryo Akizuki, and Mr. Michitaka Detani. Are you also participants in the meeting? Would you like to come with me? Thank you for your invitation. We truly appreciate it. After exchanging pleasantries, Commander Chester and the officials from the Far East region walked together toward the meeting room. They were going to participate in a meeting about how to exterminate Godzilla. After a while, they arrived at the meeting room. Although the meeting was scheduled to start in half an hour, the room was already filled with people, occupying most of the seats. Commander Chester and his group were actually among the later arrivals, which surprised them. Even though they arrived half an hour early, they were still considered late. Finding their seats, Commander Chester looked around. At this moment, in this place, most of the top-level officials from the Far East region had gathered. If Godzilla were to attack here, within seconds, it could paralyze the entire upper echelon of the Far East region. With various thoughts running through his mind, Chester observed the remaining handful of high-ranking officials gradually arriving. Half an hour later, the lights in the meeting room dimmed, and the meeting officially began. In the center of the entire hall, a busy laboratory scene was projected, and I am Andre Vakhoff, a nuclear physicist. Currently, myself and 17 other research teams are stationed at the Cavendish Laboratory at New Cambridge University, bringing you the latest analysis on the individual known as Godzilla. The first person to speak appeared to be the oldest among them. He was a renowned figure in the field of nuclear physics, the creator of the world's first commercial nuclear fusion reactor, Andrei Vakhoff. Firstly, regarding its power, we have analyzed the radiation residues left by the Graftamoni incident. We discovered that the proportion of neutron radiation and gamma radiation left behind by Godzilla is different from conventional nuclear fission. Therefore, we speculate that Godzilla is different from other titans. It is not a nuclear fission creature but a creature that sustains itself through nuclear fusion. Taking a deep breath, he continued, this greatly surprised us. There are four distinct abilities it possesses. After discussing its fusion reactor capability, we have discovered evidence of a second fusion reactor. Please observe this screen. Another projection displayed a screen with all the information about Godzilla. These are the findings compiled by our 17 teams along with 95 other teams worldwide regarding Godzilla's current state. Please look at the data. Through analyzing the spectra during Godzilla's high temperature phase, we can determine that its primary composition material is iron. However, ordinary iron falls far short of the hardness exhibited by Godzilla, so we believe. The internal pressure of Godzilla must exceed 100 GPA to generate such a stable high pressure phase of iron. We estimate that this stable high pressure phase of iron possesses compressive strength of over 50 GPA, rendering conventional armor piercing rounds and bombs completely ineffective. The professor spoke about Godzilla's immense strength, reactor materials power. In their words, Godzilla was invulnerable in these aspects. The scholars' mouths were filled with bad news. They either emphasized how strong Godzilla was or how weak modern weapons were. This caused many in attendance to throw their brows, but they held back and didn't interrupt the meeting. Time passed second by second on the projection. Until the end of the meeting, Professor Andre finally uttered the few words everyone present wanted to hear. Lastly, regarding the plan to exterminate Godzilla, we recommend primarily focusing on it. As he spoke, Professor Andre presented a blueprint, magnifying it and projecting it throughout the entire meeting room. This is what we have designed, weapons for combating Godzilla. 1. 